You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. There was no one. When you're out in the middle of the Atlantic, the closest people to you are 230 miles above you in the International Space Station orbiting the Earth. But what was probably the, the, the most amazing thing that I remember from that trip was actually the wildlife. It was, it was just stunning. And one morning, a whale came under my boat and just gently surfaced and my entire boat slid off the back of this whale. It was unbelievable. So I got up to the top and we, we got the summit photo. When I got to the top of the world, it wasn't a moment of sheer joy going, yay, yay. I was so exhausted. It's to another level exhausted. I knew where I was, but I was struggling with the lack of oxygen, you see. And as we got a little bit lower, back down towards camp four i saw what i thought were some empty oxygen cylinders and as i got closer i realized it wasn't an empty oxygen cylinder it was in fact this this poor japanese guy who'd been he was older than me he'd been climbing a few days ahead of me and the poor guy had a heart attack and he died and at the time his team were unable to bring him back down i couldn't get this thought out of my head i thought to myself wouldn't it be a great idea to cycle around the world. I, I cycled 100 miles a day for half a year. And it sounds like a lot, but it's not that big a deal. Once you get out there, yeah, in India, I had a guy point a gun at me. But for me, when I saw that, it was probably the biggest kick up the ass you can ever get. Boom, we're on. Let's go. Today's guest, we've got James Ketchell. How are you, brother? Yeah, great. Thank you ever so much for having me. I've been yeah. following you for a while and it's it's good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. It's phenomenal stories. <laughs> now, I have a lot of people from crime and sports, but to climb Everest and fly around the world in a gyroplane and you've you've been what is it, trying to be caught out in the Atlantic Ocean. You've had to get rescued uh, countless I've, occasions. I've been rescued twice, once in the uh, Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. I remember clinging to the side of a 100,000 ton crude oil tanker, climbing a tiny little rope ladder in like, storm force winds. It, it was very scary, if I'm really honest with you. Yeah. We'll talk about it. But yeah, I've had a few things go my way, a few mm -hmm. things not go my way, but I, I'm lucky. I kind of fell into this quite a few years ago. I had a very bad motorcycle accident. And uh, actually, that was great because it gave me the kick up the backside that I kind of needed, to mm -hmm. be honest. And yeah. here we are later, and I'm somehow supposed to be a professional adventurer it's life is funny right <laughs> that's funny but you went around the world you did the one of the biggest triathlons the, the biggest triathlon yeah in I, the world. I didn't come up with that yeah. i felt guilty because yeah, i'm not a very good runner first of february 2014 <laughs> james ketchup became the first and only person to have rode across the atlantic ocean successfully summited mount everest and cycled 18,000 miles around the world yeah how long did it take you to do that uh i think it was a couple of years uh it took I think it was like over a period of three. It wasn't like all back to back. And that has never been done before? No, well, it, the whole thing, the whole thing about like the ultimate triathlon was that was um, like kind of made up, if you like, by the media. So I got back from cycling around the world and the media, it was, it was a very, it was, I think it was the 1st of February, 2014. There was very little going on. So the media came out and said, hey, do you know what? We did some research. There's no one on this planet that's rode an ocean, um, been to the top of Everest and cycled around the world. It's a bit like an ultimate triathlon. And so that didn't come from me, but that term, the ultimate triathlon, just stuck. And I felt guilty because I'm a terrible swimmer and I'm a very poor runner because I have bolts in my ankle. But no one ever challenged it. And it kind of that was mm -hmm. the thing. I wanted to call the book It's All Mental, but I wasn't allowed at the time. So we called it the ultimate triathlon. Where can people get this book? May as well plug it straight away. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so they can get it on my website, jamesketchell.net, and, and I can sign it for people yeah, if they want Good stuff. To. All as the you... stories that um, actually probably sometimes I can't always share, especially when I'm out on a, on a stage, on a public mm -hmm. event, you know, a corporate event, or in the, in the book. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> always go back to the start for my guest, Jamesy Boy. Where they grew up and how it all began. Okay, so I live not too far from here. I live in Basingstoke in North Hampshire. 
and I grew up there really I was a I was a very normal young lad I I didn't really have a huge amount of confidence bizarrely I was always quite fit um, but I was very skinny so I was when I was young I was quite a fit guy but I didn't have any confidence and going into my sort of teenage years at school it was quite difficult I had a face full of, of very very bad spots and I had these massive round glasses and I would you know get called pizza face and stuff and I just didn't really school was a very difficult uh, time for me I left school without one qualification I still don't to this day um, and the best thing about school was well probably leaving if I'm honest um, but something happened I was very lucky I was about 15 16 so it was kind of like my last years at school and I, I found the gym uh, I don't mean Jim's calf I mean the gym mm -hmm. and that kind of got me into doing something that I could focus on and in the evenings I would go to the gym I was still very skinny I was very lean and ripped but I was a skinny little boy but over time, I worked out how to get stronger. I was eating better and I, was, I had this silly goal when I was like 15 that I wanted to bench press 100 kilos. It was way more than I could lift at that, mo at that moment in time. But every week I would keep going and going and going. And, and at school, I never really hung out with cool kids as such who would go out and, and get pissed and smoke and drink and, and they chatted with girls and that was a thing to do. But I, was, I had a, a few friends, but not that many. I was quite quiet. But I kind of really fell into to the gym. I really um, enjoyed it. And over time, I actually started to change physically quite considerably. You know, the spots eventually cleared up and I, I started getting bigger and stronger. And, and I, would, I never really was one for going out into town, drinking a huge amount, going way. But I did go out in town with my friends and, and it was funny because people, when I was sort of 18, 19 and, and kind, of, kind of left school, people that I saw who were the kind of cool kids were like coming up to me saying, hey, Jay, is that you? You know, I've got contact lenses so I didn't need to wear glasses anymore. And, you know, the girls that I wanted to speak to that would like say, go away. Well, now it was odd. They didn't know it was me. They were coming up to me saying, all right, how's it going? And I'm like, yeah, good. It was very, very strange uh, what happened. But that kind of developed a little bit more confidence in me. And I'll tell you this one crazy story, right? It's, it's, it's true. I was, I think I was about 19 at the time. And, you know, I'd left school for, for a few years. And I'd changed quite considerably by then. And I was out in this uh, bar, uh, kind of club. It was called Chicago. It was real cheesy. But it was fun, <laughs> I, I suppose. And um, there was this girl who, who, who was, was quite an attractive girl at, at school. And I remember I tried to talk to her once. And, um, and I, you know, I never, she never really got anywhere as such. And I was out one night. And there she was. And I was with a friend of mine. And I said... Um, yeah, let's go and chat to these these girls. And I went up to her and I was like, hey, how's it going? And and she was like, yeah, yeah, cool. I said, listen, I knew that she couldn't recognize me or she didn't. So I said, by the way, I can do some magic tricks and, and I can read your mind. And, and she was like, what are you talking about? Now, she didn't know that I knew everything about her. And so I remember saying to her, looking at her saying, I think your name is, it begins with a K, it's, it's Kelly, isn't it? And she's like, yeah, it is. How'd you know that? I'm like, oh, I told you I could read your mind. And then I remember saying, you, you know, you, you went to, to her, her Harriet Costello, right? That's the name of the school. She's like, yeah, I did. And I said, oh, that's really interesting. Do you remember a guy? I think his name was James. It may have been K K Ketchel. K and she's like, yeah, he's a dick. <laughs> it's true. This is true. Mm -hmm. He said, he's a dick. Why would you, why would you say that? And I said, well, you're looking at him. <laughs> and she was like, she looked at me and she was like, really? No, no I'm not. And I pulled out my, um, like, like driver's license thing. And, and, and she was like, it is you. And so it was funny. Things changed a lot in my teenage years. I never really, School wasn't bad, I wasn't bullied as such, but I really, really struggled. It wasn't until I left school that I started finding things that I enjoyed and, and things. And, and what happened from that was, I actually got a, you mentioned that you're working as a personal trainer. I got a job in a gym as well, and um, I really kind of enjoyed it. Um, and that was kind of my thing. I did that for, for years. Um, but then I got made redundant, and then I had to, 
had to get another job. So I remember I, I started working in, a, in some warehouse, just, um, just shifting stuff around. And, 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 and all of a sudden, the, the, the guy who ran the, the company said, we've got an event, like an exhibition that we'd like you to come to because they sold folding bikes as a sideline. But I was, and I was really interested in bikes and stuff. But no one in the warehouse was interested in 40 ones when they came back. So what I would do is I would put, I would take two or three 40 bikes and put them together and, and then and put one good one back into stock. And the, the owner said, oh, that's quite a, quite a useful thing to do. You know, if you come to this exhibition with us, you can, A, we'll pay you and um, yeah, something for you to do. And at the time, all I really cared about was just earning money because I could buy my food and my supplements and things. I was, I was big into that at the time. And I went to, to this show and without even trying, I sold like three or four times the amount of bicycles to people who were actually there to sell them. And I didn't do anything special. I was just asking questions and very similar to yourself. I just like being with people, believe it or not. I consider I spend a lot of time on my own. I do like being with people. And I remember I thought nothing of it and I came back and and uh, he said, listen, you, I'd actually got another job in a gym. And I said, listen, I've got to leave now. I've got another job in a gym. And he said, well, actually, we would like to, to offer you a job in the, the sales team, which was like moving up to the second floor above the warehouse. It was like a promotion. They were going to pay me more money. So I took that for a while. And, um, you know, it was, like, it was kind of OK. And then over time, I started gaining an interest. And I always kind of had it ever since I was young in, in sort of, adventurous things and I became aware that it was possible to row a boat across the Atlantic Ocean right not many people may think that and then a few years before well actually quite a few years before I tried it um, James Cracknell and Ben Fogel did it and I like followed them and and it kind of really hyped me up and I thought I would like to do that I and I made all these different inquiries I looked into kind of how much it would cost but there was like something just kind of holding me back. I didn't want to do it. I was worried about what other people thought. I, I didn't know if I could do it. It just seemed totally impossible to me. And I just kept putting it off and off and off. And so, you know, a few years rolled by and, and I was messing about with motorbikes for fun. I was doing a little bit of racing at the weekends. I was actually quite good at it. It was funny. I never had a huge amount of confidence when I was young but everything I seemed to pick up at I, I was quite good and despite that I still never had that much confidence it's funny how the brain kind of works and I had this I had this quite serious motorbike accident and ended up in hospital with broken legs and it wasn't that big a deal you know a lot of people lose arms and legs and and, and are in a real bad way how did you crash um, I accelerated I was I had the bike lent over I was accelerating out of a corner I put a little bit too much power down and the rear wheel span up so the the, the back of the bike came round on me it was a high side so it threw me over the handlebars um, and I'll tell you something the uh, yeah when you hit concrete at over 100 miles an hour it can be problematic yeah, yeah. and I remember actually I can remember the clearest day I was flying through the air looking back at the bike and I just had this thought going through my head thinking, shit, this is going to hurt. And it, it didn't hurt. Um, I impacted the ground quite hard and I was just knocked out instantly. But then when I came to, I had this incredible throbbing, this, this pain running through my right leg. And a doctor, he, he was there, there pretty quickly. And I, I'll never forget this. The doctor, he was, it was a very hot day and I had a blacked out visor on, on the helmet because it was very sunny. But where my head had hit the floor, the visor had been ripped off. And he was stood over me and he calmly looked into my eyes and he said, are you all right, son? And I was like, oh, my, I was gasping for breath as well. I like, had the wind knocked out of me. And I, and I said, my leg, my right leg hurts. And he looked from my eyes and he looked down and he went, oh, now, when a doctor does that, it's, it's, it's never a good sign. So then he then looked back up into my eyes and the guy was like, whatever you do, don't look down. And of course, what's the first thing, first you, thing do? you do? Isn't and that? so instead of my right foot pointing forwards, I'd snapped my ankle. So it, it was pointing backwards. And, but I was quite pleased. I had a sense of humor in the face of adversity that day because he took the boot off very gently and I had a white sock on and I had something called an open fracture. So the skin had split. So the bone had come through. Oh. So it was bleeding heavily. So my white sock was now red, dripping with the blood. And I don't know where it came from. It was the first thing that came into my mind. I said to the guy, 
have you got a camera or a phone wouldn't that make a great picture and the guy was like stop being so stupid i said okay i'm sorry then the next thing i know he started injecting morphine into me which is actually quite an amazing thing you just drift away it, it does take oh. the pain away but i don't know some people react differently but it was almost like I was drunk and I was saying, when I arrived at the hospital, I was saying things that you would ordinarily never say. You might think it. Mm -hmm. And I remember rocking up on the bed and they were pushing me into the operating theatre because my, my leg was in a bad way. And I just randomly looked at someone and said, I hope there's some fit nurses here. And, and I thought, well, my, I would never say something so stupid like that, but it's funny. <laughs> and of course, all these women just turned with this kind of frown thing. Who is this silly boy? Um, and then, yeah, and then it was a little bit of a wake up call. I remember- Were you potentially going to lose your leg? No, not the leg, but the lower ankle was, yeah. yeah. So I broke, yeah, I broke something in, or I didn't, it, it didn't just break, it shattered. And, it, and, and that's the bone called the talus bone. So the foot articulates on that bone. It has a particularly poor blood supply. So if mm -hmm. you rupture it, it's, it's not necessarily a good thing. You can mm -hmm. develop something called a vascular necrosis, which is basically where the bone is, is not getting enough blood supply and it's slowly yeah. dying. So anyway, I was very, very lucky. I had a very good surgeon, bowled it all back together, but it was a bit of a wake up call because he said to me, listen, mate, I don't know if you're gonna be able to walk properly again. This is quite serious. I s would imagine we're going to have a lot of problems. Well, you're going to have a lot of problems with this. It's not It's not just six weeks recovery, then you'll be fine. So I was like, right, okay. And I was probably a, a bit naive then. I just kept saying to the guy, no, it'll be all right. I've got a feeling. And I could see it, it was probably frustrating him because he said, no, no, I'm telling you, this is a little bit of a problem. It's not, you're not just going to be okay. And um, it was a bit of a reality check because... I was in that, I was lying in that bed for, for a quite a long time. Um, and when you have something that you do every day that you don't think of anything of, you get up and you walk around, mm. when all of a sudden you can't do that, you, you realize what you have. You only realize what you have when you haven't got something anymore. And it was funny because it was like a light switch moment because then and there, I mean, I thought to myself, I, it became very clear very quickly that I needed something to aim for. Um, it took two years, well, it took two years to make a, a, a complete recovery. Um, and I thought, you know what? I don't know how I'm gonna do it, but I know what I wanna do. I'm gonna row a boat across the Atlantic because I've been wanting to do this for years, but I've kept putting it off and off and off. And, and it, you know, sometimes when something feels right, mm -hmm. it felt right. So I didn't have a clue what I was doing, um, but I managed to kind of make it happen to a degree. I remember I went off to a boat show, the Southampton Boat Show, and I, was, and I was still on crutches at the time, and I was hobbling around with big casts on my leg. And I said to, I was going up onto, stat, onto the different stands, like touting for sponsorship, saying, look, this is what I'm gonna do, this is why I'm gonna do it, this is what I wanna do for you. So how does that go about then? If you want to do something, somebody can sponsor you? Yeah, I mean, the only way I was going to make this happen was to try and get funding because I didn't have the- How much the, was it to do it? Oh, there's, it varies on the, the type of boats that you want to buy. I couldn't afford to buy a brand new boat. So I bought a second hand boat and I wanted to do it with someone, but for some reason, no one would for do it with me. For half the price? Well, it, if you got them on, do you know what I mean? They pay half, you pay half. Yeah, I mean, so I, so long story, I'll tell you how much. It, um, I was able to secure a second hand boat, but it was a two man boat. So I had to row a two man boat on my own. Um, but the guy wanted 22,000 pounds for it, which doesn't sound a huge amount, but it was at the time for me. And so I kept going out touting for sponsorship and stuff and I wasn't really getting anywhere. And I thought, I need to take a bit of a risk. I need to do something to, to, to get this project real. So I went down the local bank, a bank with Barclays, and I said, listen, I wanna buy a new car. And the guy was like, yeah, yeah, how much do you wanna borrow? I said, well, I think 15,000 pounds will be good. And he said, well, computer tells me you can borrow 22 you get a better car i said yes that that's going to be perfect i'll take that no i didn't want to tell them that i was buying a second hand rowing boat mm. to cross the atlantic in in case they were like mate computer says no yeah, 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 yeah. so i walked out of the bank with this money and i i but i still had to make the repayments so i bought this second hand boat but when i had this boat the project became real 
that I could say to people, this is, this is the boat that I'm going to row across the Atlantic in. That's where you sleep. This is where you row. This is how you uh, make your water. That's the toilet. It's called bucket and chuck it, you know? And this is, and now, oh, by the way, you can have your company logo here. And, and sure enough, it paid off. I remember I towed it on a trailer to a rugby game at Twickenham, um, just down the road. And, and, you know, I was shaking a bucket and you'll be amazed at what will happen when you just put yourself out there and you, you start telling enough people what you're going to do, you, you will inspire someone to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, but it takes quite a while to get to that point. So I managed to get all the funding together and I shipped the boat out to a little place called La Gomera, which is in the Canary Islands, just off the coast of North Africa. And so I'm rowing to Antigua in the Caribbean. So that's, it's about 3,000 miles. So it's quite a long way to row. Um, and it's actually the same route that Christopher Columbus used back in the late uh, 15th century, I think, when he discovered the Americas. Um, he usually has about 80, I think he had about 80 crew on his, his boat, and there, and there was just me on my own. He was Spanish? Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. yeah, I think he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I think so. Uh, he was. I, I, <laughs> I, think, I think he was. Um, but it's interesting because something happened quite quickly. I remember unloading the boat and stuff, and I was out looking out at the the, 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 the Atlantic one evening um, I look, and the waves, it was a particularly rough day, they were smashing up against the harbour wall and I thought to myself, oh dear, what the hell am I doing? Is this really a good idea? Because like, although I made the, the decision to do it when I was lying in hospital, I was in my comfort zone. I, I was in a safe environment. I had people around me that I knew. I was in, a, in my comfort zone, right? And that's when a lot of people quite often make decisions to do something. But I then all of a sudden was out of my comfort zone looking out at the Atlantic thinking, how the hell am I gonna row this boat 3,000 miles to the Caribbean? I don't know if I can do it. And it was interesting because I got chatting to an old boy who happened to be knocking around the harbor. And he said, are you, are you nervous? And I'm like, uh, yes, I am. And he said, and this guy, he'd sailed around the world, I think three or four times. He was a real old sea dog as well. You could just tell by looking at him. And I remember he said to me, if you can get through the first three days, you will be able to survive three months. It is all in your head, the whole lot. And I thought, all right, okay. So I just, I, I never let those words go out of my head. It's three days, three days. All I've got to do is get through the first three days. And I remember I set off and the reality will hit you quick that you're trying to row this little boat, which is about 20, I think mine was 23 feet long. What's the training for that? Believe it or not, you don't have to be as fit as you might think to, to, to do this. It's, it's really all in the mind. I rowed a lot um, like on indoor rowers and I got fit and was already fit to a degree. But here's the thing. There's no point in training like a maniac and turning up at the start line, the fittest guy there, but you've overlooked all the important stuff, which is the funding and actually getting the boat. So I had, to, so I was juggling loads of different things. I was juggling the funding, the technical aspect of the boat, making sure the boat was all fitted out with the correct kit. So I did train like hard. Is it more mental thing? <laughs> Rowing across the Atlantic is ninety nine percent in your head and one percent physical. How there may be the people. Boat? The, the boat was, was the boat? 23 feet long. So I, I had a two, you couldn't, you can get a smaller boat now. Any dodgy waves or anything? Any yeah, so you're gonna, yeah, you're gonna get, I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that. You're yeah. gonna get some pretty serious mm -hmm. um, waves. So I remember, I'll, I'll, I'll t take you on a little yeah, bit of a journey yeah, yeah, yeah. across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. um, so the first day I was like running on adrenaline. I was all hyped up. But that, I remember that evening it was, yeah, it was the reality was starting to kick in because you it's, you can get seasick quite quickly and that can be quite debilitating. Luckily, I wasn't seasick. I was very very lucky. But you're looking at the you have like for all intents and purposes, it's a speedo. It's it's a chart plotter and it tells you how fast you're going. And I was expecting to be rowing at a certain pace and I was like I was rowing hard and I wasn't even, I think I was like getting one knot, which is really, really slow. I was expecting the boat to move at least two and a half to three knots. And so the reality hits you, well, hang about, if I can't get the boat moving much faster than this, this is gonna take like 
half a year to get across. It's going to be crazy. I can't do this. And so your, your, your brain will start playing tricks on you very, very quickly. And you'll start looking for a way out. You'll start telling yourself, ah, oh, you know, maybe we're not ready. Maybe let's come back another day. Let's do this another day. And you'll be surprised how the brain will really try and, and mess you up like that. But I kept these guys' words in my head and I thought, I've just got to get through three days. I've got to get through three days. And I got through the three days and then I got, eventually I got to the halfway point and something just clicked. I thought to myself, hang about, I'm somehow going to do this because you can't grasp just how big a feat it is to row a boat 3,000 miles. So your brain won't comprehend that. But once you get to the halfway point, all of a sudden I thought, I'm going to do this. And it became real. And so every day I was hyped up. I was rowing harder. I was rowing faster. I got trying to row faster and longer. Did you longer. contact with anyone? And there was no one. When you're out in the middle of the Atlantic, the closest people to you are 230 miles above you in the International Space Station orbiting the Earth. So it's pretty remote once you get out there. Having said that, you do pass through shipping lanes. So I was almost run over by a, a bulk carrier, uh, but I had a, like a, a radar system on my boat mm -hmm. that would tell me if anything was coming because you have to get out of there. What's way. it like at night time? Beautiful. Stars. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Shooting it, stars. It just oh, incredible. Yeah. It really is. And on a, and I'll come on to the waves and yeah. stuff. On you get areas of high pressure. So that basically means it, high pressure is good weather. And so what will happen is when the wind drops, the water will go like a sheet of glass, just beautiful. And that's when you can get out of the boat and you can swim around, but you have to remain tied on because the boat will surprisingly quickly drift away from you. Um, so you've got to be pretty careful in that sense. But like at night, it was just magical, especially on a clear night as well. But what was probably the, the, the most amazing thing that I remember from that trip was actually the wildlife. It was, it was just stunning, like huge uh, fin whales, okay? They're the size of a bus. They would swim right up to the side of the boat. And I remember looking eye to eye with a fin whale. And, and they would sometimes sort of scrape the side of the boat, but you don't want that to happen because they're so big and powerful, they smash the boat up. And one morning, a whale came under my boat and just gently surfaced and my entire boat slid off the back of this whale. It was unbelievable. Um, yeah, you know, flying. What would happen if your boat toppled? Oh, that happened. It's no problem. It's designed. To, okay, so the boat is designed to self-right. Right. So if it does roll over, it will come back up again. The oh, right. safest place you can be is inside that boat because mm -hmm. they're actually quite safe. There's layers of foam in between the carbon fiber. Mine wasn't a carbon fiber, but some of the other boats that I had was. And so you could cut it in half and it will sit and float on the surface. They just don't really sink. They're incredible. So that put your mind at ease at night? Yeah, to, to a degree. But here, I'll tell you something interesting. So I thought that I had this sort of, call it a radar. It's called AIS, Automatic Identification System. It's a bit like a radar that's keeping watch on you. So if a large vessel comes close to me, an alarm will go off. So I thought that that was working and I found out. So every night I'd go and you would sleep so well. Trust me, when you row in 12 hours a day, you have no problem sleeping. And it was a very weird dreams when you're that tired. It's funny what happens. And I got to the end and I did get to Antigua and I found out that that AIS system was never working. So when I was sleeping at night thinking, oh, I was, okay, I've got this safety net working that never worked once. Mm -hmm. But I'll tell you something crazy that happened. And I'm, I'm not really a religious guy, but perhaps I'm quite spiritual. My grandfather passed away a couple of months before I was about to row across the Atlantic. I mean, he was very unwell. He was going to die anyway. But I wanted him to stay alive long enough to see his grandson complete this kind of feat, which I believe he would have been quite proud of. And so I thought, that's a real pain in the ass that he's not here to see that. So I put his name on the boat and, and his name was Rocky Rochelle. And, and so then I put my other granddad's name on the boat. And it was, it was crazy. There were times, you ask about at night, there were times at night 
when it was very, very still. But sometimes it could be quite eerie, especially if it's quite cloudy, there's wind. You can't hear, you can hear the waves, but you don't know where they're coming from. They're smashing over the boat, you're getting wet, and at night it's quite cold. And it can just be, it can be quite an intimidating place. And, and, and this happened twice. I was rowing, and all of a sudden it was like someone was sat next to me. All of a sudden I had this feeling of warmth. I was uh, uh, really happy, like I'd just taken an amazing happy pill. And, and it was like someone was there next to me keeping watch on me. It was difficult to explain, but I do believe someone was looking down on me when I was out there because loads of different things happened mm -hmm. that were just, is that, is that real? I mean, it's a hell of a coincidence. And, did um, you ever get scared? No, I was never once scared because when I did go through those times of, of potentially feeling a bit scared, it was almost like this reassuring presence just mm -hmm. turned up. Protecting you? It, it was. It yeah. was crazy how it happened. It really was. And and at night it was, I mean, I, I don't remember much about the night. I mean, I rode till about one o'clock in the morning. So I got to see, I mean, and it got dark. Got around. sharks? Yeah, I'll come on to that now, actually. It was fascinating. I had some oceanic white tip sharks follow me mm -hmm. and I wanted them to come closer so Why? I could take pictures. Just for photos? Yeah, I wanted to take some pictures and I wanted to do some underwater filming because I thought it'd be very interesting. So I was throwing bits of food in to get them to come closer, but they're remarkably intelligent. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't actually actually come that close to the boat they just they would just stay that little bit back and they were swimming around it and I had this I had this kind of mindset that I could probably just jump in but I, I didn't <laughs> but I, I did that, I did swim I, I did swim a lot though but I was aware that there were sharks out there but how was the weather yeah, the, for the most part, the weather was quite good. Like sun, like sun, I'm talking very about high hot, degrees. Very, very hot. Do you have hot. a lot of sun cream in that then? How yeah, do you yeah, so when I arrived in in English Harbour in Antigua, I'd lost 30 kilos and I was proper brown. You wouldn't recognise me. My hair was completely blonde. So it's like a watery desert. There's water everywhere. You, you can't drink it. And 10 kilos and about five stone. I lost a lot of weight. Shit. I was quite quite a big chap when How I... How much food did you have in the boat? Well, here's an interesting thing. So I expected the crossing at worst to be about 100 days. It usually takes about 70 or 80 days for a solo rower to get across. But there was a lot of areas of low pressure. Now, that low pressure is basically bad weather. And the prevailing winds, the route that I took, effectively, for the most part, blow you across the Atlantic. But they were doing the complete opposite when I was out there. It was just my luck. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting blown across, I was actually getting blown back. And it took 110 days, four hours and four minutes. No, I was counting, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and because of that, I actually ran out of food. I ran out of food uh, 230 miles from Antigua. And you'll never, ever hear me use the word starving. Because when you find out what it's like, it's, it's actually not very nice. Now, I was lucky I was able to get a resupply from a yacht. So it wasn't really a life or death situation, but it was quite, uh, it was quite an uncomfortable. What then if you'd never had that on a yacht? Uh, I, would have, you would, I would have got some support from someone. I had a satellite phone. What about you killing your own fish? They, those, extreme? let me tell you, fish, those fish are extremely intelligent, smart little things. So I was able to fish but it was almost like they knew I had a hook because they were picking the bait. I was watching them. They were picking the bait off the hook yeah. and then swimming off. I don't know how they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. But I mean, actually, while we were talking about the wildlife, it was just, just amazing. I mean, like, I never really thought flying fish actually fly, but trust me, they really do fly. I mean, I was hit in the face with one. It was, I remember, <laughs> yeah, it's true. It was one, it was one o'clock in the morning. I've been rowing all through the day. I was very, very tired. And actually that was an evening where it was very, very dark because when the, the, there's thick cloud and the moon isn't out, it, it's a darkness that most people have never experienced before. You can't see your hand in front of your face. It's proper dark. So my head torch was illuminating the area in front of me. And I've been, I, I was tired because I've been rowing all through the day and, and I'd pulled my oars in and I was about to, to lie down in my tiny little cabin at the back. And uh, my head torch was like just illuminating the area in front of me. And this white object came flying out of the water, bang, hit me in the face. I thought, shit, what was that? And I think where I was so tired, my brain wasn't working. I thought I'd just been hit by a golf ball. 
because it was like it was that quick i thought i've just been hit by a golf ball Fuck. and it, of course it wasn't and it was this little flying fish and it was sort of flapping up and down on the deck and i thought what i what do I do with this thing? Do I, do I try and eat it? Nah, it's small and bony. So I, I threw it back in so it could hit someone else in the face another day. But my, my left side of my face was covered in fish scales and it stank. But it was, it was an interesting experience. What happens and, if you get injured? What happens if you break a foot or break a leg? Because obviously your leg's about yeah, you're Yeah, you're in a lot of trouble. Are you um, stuck out there? Have you got a radio stuck out, or anything? You're not stuck out there. Do you have a radio? Yeah, yeah. So you have a satellite. I'll come on to that because yeah. I took a guy across the Atlantic in 2016 and that happened. So we'll talk about that in a mm -hmm. bit. Uh, but yes, I had a tracker on board the boat and I had a satellite phone. And th and like social media had only just started back then. So mm -hmm. I, I I don't even think I had a Twitter account. What year account. was this? 2010. So it was, yeah. it was going back a while. So social media wasn't what it yeah, was, it was now. And, and is now. So yeah, but I, I did have means of staying connected. Um, and I, when, I, when I ran out of food, actually, I remember, I'm very close to my parents, and I would ring them up and say, hey, how's it going? And they'd say, yeah, yeah, we're out having a Chinese. It's really nice. How, how are you? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. But that's the kind of, mm -hmm. like, the, the kind mm -hmm. of, just the relationship we had. And then sure enough, that I was able to get back and, and, and we had one with them. But probably the most amazing thing was just actually being out there and doing it. And one of the things that became apparent to me quite quickly was, you know what, I've put this off for so many years and I wish I hadn't. It wasn't as difficult as I thought it would be. Sure, I was tired. Sure, I was hungry mm. at times. And there were times when it was a bit scary. Lonely. I was never lonely because I, I wanted to be there so you badly. To be free. Well, I didn't want to be free. I'm, I'm a very sociable person, but I, I, I was obsessed with this goal. My whole life revolved around this mm. goal of somehow rowing across the Atlantic. And when I was out there doing it, I felt like I was... Achieving it. Achieving it. But something interesting happened when I did get to the other end, which, which, which I'll come, come on to. But, um, I, yeah, it's not that difficult. And probably most people watching and listening to us, if they decided they wanted to do it, could actually do it. It's Don't start putting it, ideas it, in yeah. my head, man. I'll be like, ah, you, fuck it, I'm you, doing you, it. You, you, but you've got to want it. Um, yeah. If you only want it, you know, if you want it 99%, See, that would, other yeah, will get the I would do it for the mindset of it. See, yeah. I've, I've visualized myself doing 50 mile runs and yeah all, and um 100 mile runs i've i can smash out and i'm f just over 14 stone and i can still do 15 yeah. 16 mile runs yeah i visualize myself i don't know why i, I always visualize myself doing a 100 mile run i always I, I watch a lot of david goggins and yeah absolute crackpot yeah. i just yeah. think yeah is to test myself to the absolute limits yeah to the absolute limits that people people watch and think no fucking chance that would make me yeah. go out and do it yeah. to push yourself to the ultimate extreme not just physically it's all about the mental battle it is because you can go out and do your 100 mile run you can definitely do that and that'll be a challenge but when you're out in the Atlantic it's like doing it every day Yeah, and there is no nice hotel mm -hmm. to go home you're just lying you're eating your ration packs your dehydrated ration packs which actually become quite nice when you are hungry and then you know you're, there's your little what did mattress. your mum and dad say? Here's something very interesting. They initially were not very happy about it. And I don't think in the beginning, I don't think that's because they wanted to deny me of the opportunity. I think they were generally a bit concerned about their son row going off on his own and rowing across the Atlantic. And then what happened over time, they saw me working to a level uh, that I'd never worked to before. And they were like, Jesus, J James is on another level. We've never <laughs> seen, this guy wants this. We've never seen this before. Yeah. You've been our son for God knows how many years, but we've never seen you this focused. Were they surprised? Yeah, I think so. And then when, when they saw that I wanted this badly, badly, I was working a full-time job whilst... Uh, making this happen as well and and so it was I was juggling a lot of things and it, it was quite difficult actually and I think they then turned from sort of being a bit anti to my greatest supporters they were really really kind of behind me and actually I'll tell you what happened they never got to see me arrive because I don't know if you remember 
uh, back in, I think it was April, yeah, April 2010, there was a massive volcano that erupted in Iceland, chucked an ash cloud. Yeah, Do you remember yeah, that? Yeah, Grounded yeah. flights all around the fleets, all the world. We screwed yeah. up a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So so I've got this tracker on the boat, right? So for, don't forget, I was out there for nearly four months. That's a long time. So they're watching their son on the tracker. You know, they're, they're sending me messages saying, why are you rowing backwards? I say, I'm not rowing backwards. It's the wind blowing me back. You know, there's not much you can really do about it. Mm -hmm. It's quite demoralizing. What do you do then if the wind's blowing your back? Do you just yeah. hold on? Or what do you no, do? so you use something called a para anchor. You can't drop a physical anchor because it's three miles to the bottom. So you're never that far from land. It's just the wrong way. Um, so you would use something called a para anchor and that's like a parachute. So you deploy that into the water and it's attached to the boat. So the wind will be pushing the boat back, but then the, the, the para anchor will open up and fill with water and it will minimize your loss of ground. So instead of getting blown back at quite a, a rate, this will like hold your position. So there are things you can do to limit your loss of ground. And also in rough weather, you you always want the boat to be going into the, the wave or with it because if the boat goes beam on okay so sideways the boat will just roll straight over when a wave picks it up and there's two types of waves you've got the steep waves and they're the tricky ones because they'll just flip the boat over but then you also have large waves but they're long and rolling they're the good ones as long as they go in the right way the boat will surf down them and you can get some quite good speed um so yeah um what was it like then once you completed that when nobody was there then well i'll tell you yeah that, i was yeah i'll come on to that now because there was someone there what actually happened was my parents they'd been looking forward to coming out mm. to antigua to see me so they're driving to the airport and my their flight out to english harbor and to, to antigua is cancelled so I'm like, okay, so that's that's no good. But it just so happened that it happened to be Antigua Race Week, which is basically when all these rich Americans get together and they race yachts around the island. Now, somehow the word got out that this lunatic from Britain on his own, me, was about to row into English Harbour, into Antigua. And so the, it was it was a bit crazy. When my, although my parents weren't there, when I arrived, there were hundreds of people everywhere. Like there were super yachts in the in the kind of marina, honking their horns and stuff. People were coming out. Um, you, you're wanting to give me beers, and you, you can dine out on free beers a long time. Were you buzzing? You, yeah, I was. It was incredible. I hadn't you seen. No, I wasn't crying. I wasn't. I wasn't emotional yeah. like that i wasn't crying it's a big fucking achievement man. Uh, yeah but do, do, yeah it, i suppose so i was kind of really wrapped up in it um but i'll tell you something interesting that happened i i i actually ended up sailing back by the way because i couldn't get a flight off the <laughs> island it was crazy how it happened it's another story but what do you mean uh, sailing back well i'll tell you what happened i was for where you started no i no i sailed back to europe uh -huh. uh, not, oh. not to um, the starting point not, not to the starting point yeah. but I'd never planned that to happen so basically I couldn't get a flight off the island and stuff and, and I wasn't in a particular rush to get home and so I'm out I'm out on my own and I'm ha eating chocolate ice cream and a husband and wife came up to me and said oh yeah well done on your row I said thanks very much and they ended up sitting with me and we, we chatted for a while and they said how do you intend to get home and I said to be honest I haven't really given it much thought I'm just chilling. And she said, well, I'll tell you what, we are sailing back to Europe and we're shorthanded. So that means they don't have enough crew. Do you fancy joining us? And I was like, well, I don't really know. I've just spent four months on my own out in the Atlantic in this tiny little boat. And she was like, the wife, she was a lovely lady. She said, well, I'll tell you what, come and have a look at our boat and see what you think. So I said, yeah, sure. There were some really nice boats in the marina. And so I remember... I walked over to this boat and it was a 54 foot brand, beautiful, it was made by a company called Sun Odyssey, a French Genoa, French company, lovely, half a million pounds worth of yachts. And so I walk up onto the deck and I remember she was like, we had this custom barbecue put in here. The fridge is here, this is where we keep all the beers. Oh, you can have the master bedroom at the front, which is a double bed with an ensuite. And so this is quite a different experience to what I've just crossed the Atlantic in. And to be honest, it took me about 30 seconds and I just said, yeah, I'm in. 
So by default, I ended up sailing back across it. I never planned to. Uh -huh. It was crazy. And actually, my boss... Was that more luxury for you? Yeah, that was crazy. My boss was ringing me up saying, where are you? Because you? they held my job open for me. And so I managed, to, I managed to get back. But what happened quite quickly is I thought that once I'd completed this you know, fairly big feat of rowing a boat across the Atlantic, I'd be eternally happy for the rest yeah. of my life so and everything would be perfect. Doesn't exist, doesn't happen. Oh. You are on a high for quite a while. Yeah. But a couple of days. Uh, it literally, yeah, and then it'll go. It's not I, for years and years and not, years. A yeah, yeah. couple of days, if that, yep. when I achieve goals are targets, <laughs> I'm talking 10 minutes, Yeah. boom, gone, yeah. pain, misery, trauma, yeah. it flicks back and I go, okay, well, I need to keep going. I need to push myself, yeah. I need to go. Yeah. But do a bit of fitness, keep working. Yeah. Because yeah. no matter, like you say, you've just sailed the Atlantic. You've, you've rode it, you've sailed it. Yeah. and It's completed. It, yeah, and it's done. Back it's in the to, past. Yeah. Back to reality. Mm -hmm. Reality was waiting for me at home saying, thank you, you're now back. Were you, trying to, were you trying to escape from something? No, I wasn't really trying to escape. Were you looking just, for answers? Just if I go here, maybe just, I can figure life out a bit. I, had, I didn't. Okay, so I just wanted to do it. I had no idea that it would end up leading on to a, a career in doing these types of things mm -hmm. and taking other people across oceans and climbing this and flying that and speaking here. Mm -hmm. I, didn't, I didn't know that. I mean, I was probably quite naive. I didn't even really know that you could be a professional speaker back then. I, it was mm -hmm. just something that I, I, was, I was kind of doing. But I say to kids, you know, when you push yourself outside of your comfort zone and you do something you haven't done before, it's got to be an action to get a reaction doors of opportunity will just naturally open. And I only set out to row across the Atlantic. I had no desire to do anything else. But during my preparation, I met a guy who was also rowing across the Atlantic with another bloke. He found a partner to do it with. And he was a really nice guy. And we just kind of clicked and we helped each other prepare a little bit. He was a smart bloke. He was older than me and he was a doctor. Uh, in it. So he, he worked for, I remember he worked for six months flat out as a doctor. And then for the other six months, he'd go away on expeditions. And he was a very accomplished high altitude climber. The guy had summited Everest five times. His name's Rob, Rob Cassidy, a great guy. And we just became really good friends. And he said to me, look, after the row, come out and climb Everest with me. And I'm like, okay, I've climbed before, but not to that level. I don't know if I can do it. And he said, I guarantee you you can do it and so it was strange i got back from from the row and it was quite difficult going back into the office i must say for the first few weeks but then like the novelty wore off after the first day and i was like wow wow that was it it was history so i'm like okay yeah, okay and so the next thing was you know what, what am i going to do but but being out there and completing the process of organizing this project making it happen and, and, and yeah and completing it yeah. kind of give you a bit of self-worth confidence it, that you can not achieve anything well basically you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it but yeah. from going back into an office the fast run pace the society the sheep yeah. the 95 yeah. people talking shit people yeah. drinking you were out there alone just yeah, it did you feel like bliss out there? Did you feel yeah, alive? Yes, yes, I felt very alive. Yeah. I don't feel alive really when I'm just kind of going about my daily business. Mm -hmm. When I'm out doing something that I've worked towards, that's when I come alive and mm -hmm. it makes me feel quite happy. And it's very difficult to describe what that's really like to someone who's never really pushed themselves hard to achieve yeah. something that they want to achieve. I wish I could take that feeling of what it's like and, and say, here you go, uh, Mr. Yeah. Joe Bloggs. This is what you're going to feel like if you get your head down and achieve X, Y, Z, whatever it is you want to achieve. Mm -hmm. You don't have to row oceans. The world would be crazy if mm -hmm. everyone did what I did. But um, So was that so, the stepping stone to do Everest straight after yeah, that? Yeah, basically it was. I found myself in this position where I got back from, from the row I was back at work and I thought, you know what? I, I am never ever gonna get the opportunity, this opportunity to go out to Everest again. I don't even know if I can do it, but I'd much rather have a go and it not work out than be left wondering. But does it work out and Everest are dead? Uh, to a degree you could be, yeah. you could be. So there's a high, it's fairly high risk, but I was willing to take that risk and 
again. Feel alive again. I, it made me feel like, and as soon as I made that conscious, conscious decision that <laughs> I was going to do it, but here's the hard part. I still had a boat. I was in debt because I had the boat. And so I managed to find some other lunatic to sell it to when I got back. So I cleared off the debt of, of the boat and um, I started fundraising for Everest. Now, this is where things got tricky. I thought and I was expecting it to be quite easy because I just had the credibility of rowing across the Atlantic, right? So surely I'll be able to get sponsored. I, was, I raised money for a great charity when I rowed the Atlantic and I was raising money for a charity that helped disabled children when I climbed Everest. And I, I, you know, I kind of come from a bit of a sales background and I thought, you know what, I'm going to get on the phones and call some people and see what we can make happen. And I started off really confident. And then all of a sudden, no one was interested. They wanted to talk to me about the Atlantic. And I was like, yeah, that's a good effort. But no, no one would back me. And, I, and this was all kind of quite last minute as well. So I didn't have that long to get the money together to go out and, and climb Everest. So I, I, I got very proactive. And, but it didn't, nothing was happening. And so I remember... Rob called me up and said, listen, you know, how are you getting on with, with the funding? And I said, well, to be honest, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this because I just can't get the funding. Nothing was happening, right? But I didn't really have the heart to say I can't go. I don't know what it was. There was something inside me that just said, keep trying. Send another email. Send another email. And one day I got lucky. Right? I pinged an email off to a company called Ben Sherman. You know, they make shirts. Yeah, yeah. And the guy came back to me. I spent like three hours on the phone with him and he was like asking all the right questions. You know, what am I, you know, what can I do for the sponsorship? What, how does this work? How does that work? And I'm thinking, great, great. And then literally three hours passes and the guy's like, oh, I can't sponsor you. I was just interested to know. And I'm like, you know, we've just wasted like quite a few hours of our yeah. time here. And I, but I bit my tongue. I didn't say what I wanted to say. And just before he hung up, he said, oh, hang about. Um, I think I might be able to do something for you. And I was like, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, listen, I've got this spreadsheet. Within this spreadsheet, there's like a thousand different CEO, marketing director, all their email addresses and names are in this. You know, I, don't, don't tell anyone where you got this from, but you can spam every single one of them. It was before all this GDPR nonsense and stuff. You can't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. So I got this database. I sent every single email out. Well, I thought every single email. I didn't get one reply. And so I didn't have the guts to actually ring up Rob and say, mate, I'm, I'm not going to be able to come to Everest. And I was typing the email out to him. And as I was typing the email, I, I knocked the mouse and, and the Excel spreadsheet for some reason came to the front of the screen. And I realized that I hadn't quite scrolled down. There was one guy left, okay? And his name was Andrew. And he was the marketing director for, for a company that I'd imagine everyone now knows. And that's Nando's. They make great chicken burgers. Yeah. Didn't see the connection between Nando's chicken burgers and climbing Everest. And I, if I'm honest, I wasn't going to bother sending the email. But I thought, well, it's already pre-written. All I've got to do is put the guy's name in it. And if I don't send it, then you can be pretty sure nothing's going to happen. So I ping this email off. And unbelievably, the guy came back within half an hour. He called me answered the phone and he was like, uh, James, this is Andrew from Nando's here. I've just read your email and it's bloody brilliant. But tell me one thing. Do you actually eat Nando's? And I'm like, uh, yes. Yes. The best I, thing ever. I, I, they really are. Great. I, they're great. I go to Nando's every single day uh, and I take my friends. It costs me a fortune, but I can only eat lemon and herb. I can't eat anything spicy. And I said that to the guy. And he was like, really? You've rode the Atlantic and you're going out to Everest and you can't eat our hot chicken. I was like, yeah, it's true. And he went, that is a bloody brilliant story. Come and meet me. So the next day I went up to Putney, which is where their head office was. And 24 hours later, and by this point, I only had a week left to pay the bill. Nando's had sponsored me to climb Everest. Mm -hmm. How crazy is That's that? Mad. But I, I, I kind of learned something at that point because... I basically kind of embarrassed to say I'd given up. I didn't think I was going to get that money and I didn't do anything special. I just kept sending it again and again and again. I didn't stop. Mm. And 
the time that you can't be bothered to do something, but you make the effort to do it. That's when it happens. Bingo. Yeah. That's when sale. stuff starts yeah. happening for you. I always say it as well. Yeah. When the days you're feeling your lowest, if you can get out to the gym or get out and do something, that's the, that's the day that you'll find the success. That makes the difference. Yeah, yeah, indeed. yeah. Indeed. So what is the process to Everest? How long does it take to get to the top Everest? Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So I got out to Everest, got, got the money to yeah. get out How there. How long, and, but from... How long should it take to climb it? Is it three months, four months? Or is it six months? No, it takes about six weeks from door to door. So, that, yeah, how, so, long, how long in all does it take to climb Everest? Well, you have to go up and down. Different stages. So there's different stages. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I'll explain. So you, you arrive into Kathmandu, then you fly up to a place called Lukla, mm -hmm. um, depending on if you're going to climb from the south side or the north side. So the south side is from Nepal, the north side is via Tibet. And um, the south side is looked upon as being the slightly easier side because you just go straight up. Whereas on the north side, you go up and then you traverse along. So you're at high altitude for a lot longer. So generally, so from, from arriving at Lukla and walking up to Everest Base Camp generally takes about 10 days. So the idea is you want to acclimatize and, and go very slowly. The slower you can ascend, the better chance your body will have of um, acclimatizing basically so then once you get up to everest base camp you you're only you know you're only at base camp you, you still got to get to the top and it's broken down into different camps you've got camp you go through the ice fall first and that's quite a dangerous part of of the climb it's this huge area of mass of, of ice that's moving and shifting and it can collapse so the sherpas will put ladders down and you have to get across them and yeah, it, it's in columns <sighs> so if they Put the ladders across people need to walk yeah. across them with the, the drop yeah 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 um, and uh, yeah but it's quite difficult to begin with because you're massively outside how of many your of them zone. do you need to cross it all depends that because the ice uh, the, the ice fall is moving and shifting and changing all the time mm -hmm. so there may only be a few ladders but then by the time the expedition's finished it may have all shifted and there may be more but inevitably there's always uh, two or three large ones where you, you're looking down and you can't see the bottom how many is in your team? Uh, there, I only had a very small team there was only three of us there was uh, a young girl and, uh, and a lot, man. A, well, we did have a Sherpa. We had a couple of Sherpas as well. So I was very What's lucky. Uh, so we had a Sherpa. So a Sherpa is, is, is someone who lives and works high up in the mountain. They're the guide. Mm -hmm. They're the, the people that have the, the real kind of skill set to get yeah. you. I mean, I, I knew what I was doing to agree. I had climbed some other mountains. Uh, before but not to, to, that to, scale. to that level how many different checkpoints are there so there's four different camps so you've got base camp then you've got camp one mm -hmm. then you've got camp two then you've got camp three then you've got camp four then you've got the summit so what you'll do is you'll make a couple of what's called like acclimatization climbs up to camp one and camp two you'll stay there for the night then you'll come back down to base camp and you take a bit more rest then you'll go back up to like camp two you'll stay there for a night then you'll go up to camp three and you'll stay there for a night but then you'll come all the way back down to base camp and take a bit more rest and at that point once you've done that a few times your body has produced more red blood cells um, and the red blood cells are the, the blood cells that carry the oxygen around the body. And it's, it's really interesting. Oh, so you don't go camp one, camp two, camp three, camp four. Correct. Summer. No. So you go one, down, up two, down, up three, Correct. down. Correct. No That's way. That's why I'm fucked. saying it takes, it's, it's, not yeah. a, it's not a simple thing to just rock up and go to the top. So how long you would can't. it take for somebody to go camp one to the top? How long? Uh, well, I can tell you that's about four yeah. days. So you can do everything in four days? Once you've gone through your the process. process, yes. Yeah. So if you were to do Everest again, could it take you a week, two weeks to do it? No, I'd still take the same amount of time because I'd still have to go for it. It doesn't matter how fit there's So what's no the camps like then? Tell me. I'm intrigued, mate. I love this shit. So the, the, the camps at Base Camp and Camp 2, are uh, you will be surprised. They are very, very well equipped. There's a big mess tent that you share with other climbers and things. And the food that the chefs put put together is will just blow you away it's it's unbelievable but as you get higher up um your body actually shuts down so you, that that urge to eat goes you have to force yourself to eat and so i remember when i was on my pushing up to to camp four and then from camp four once you get up to camp four you, you've got about a 24-hour window to get up to the summit and back to to camp four then back down again and at that point, you're just eating like biscuits, squeezy cheese, anything that's high in calories. 
and you have to just keep forcing it down and that, and it's quite difficult to be honest but when you get up to the top you are running on adrenaline um and you it's quite interesting for, because from sort of camp three onwards you go on to using supplementary oxygen so you're breathing the atmospheric air around you but this is just topping you up um and that makes it you know a bit easier um and then so what you'll get up to camp four but then what will happen is that night you'll climb through the night so you can arrive on the summit in the morning the sun's coming up and you can get back down in the daylight um but I, again i was very lucky you know in the media you might see all these pictures of a queue of people and, but it wasn't like that for me it was me and my sherpa stood on top of the world no one else was there was there any time you were ever scared up there yes i was um uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what happened on the descent. I didn't know, but at base camp, I p picked up a, a lung infection. I just got tired and I was a bit unwell, but it was marked by the adrenaline and the excitement that was kind of like rushing through me. So I got up to the top and we, we got the summit photo. When I got to the top of the world, it wasn't a moment of sheer joy going, yay, yay. I was so exhausted. It, it's to another level exhausted i knew where i was but i was struggling with the lack of oxygen you see so my brain was kind of numb i didn't have any emotion i was emotionless but i knew i had to get the flag the nando's flag out the bag oh, and take yeah, all the yeah, pitch yeah. so i'm like at the, so I'm at the top of everest just fulfilling all my sponsorship commitments you just got that ticket to the bottom uh, and just yeah. edited that <laughs> yeah, yeah. so yeah i'm just i'm just doing all that but then all of a sudden I go and, you know, Dorji and myself, we get a few pictures and stuff. And this was on the 16th of May at 8.30 in the morning um, in 2011. So this is quite a while ago now. And all of a sudden on the way back down, I lost the ability to breathe. I couldn't control my breathing. And Dorji was going berserk saying, listen, you're, you're going too slow. If you don't get a move on, you're going to run out of energy and, and well, you're going to run out of oxygen and it's going to get dark. It's going to get cold. You're not going to get down. You're going to die. And it, <sighs> It was quite difficult. I knew if I kept moving, I would be okay. And Dorji kept shouting at me, listen, do you want to be like that Japanese guy? Do you want to be like that Japanese guy? And I'm thinking to myself, what the hell are you talking about? And as we got a little bit lower, back down towards Camp 4, I saw what I thought were some empty oxygen cylinders. Because Everest, my experience is Everest was not a rubbish dump. For me, I think it was it was relatively clean. But every now and then you do see an empty oxygen cylinder or something that's just been left there. And as I got closer, I realized it wasn't an empty oxygen cylinder. It was, in fact, this, this poor Japanese guy who'd been, he was older than me. He'd been climbing a few days ahead of me. And the poor guy had a heart attack and he died. And at the time, his team were unable to bring him back down. Right. So he was temporarily left there. He was repatriated with his family eventually. Um, it's a, I think I mentioned earlier, it's a bit of a myth that Everest is littered with dead bodies. They, they, that's not Green Boots, is that? Yeah, he's on the north. I don't even know if that guy's still there. But that's what, on Green a, Boots, not, is that the man? He, he was, he's a chap that passed away many years ago. He may, he is on the north side, so I didn't get to see him. Um, but the locals, they will try, if they can, they will try to bring someone back down so they can be repatriated with their family oh. if, if, it's, if it's possible. But logistically, it's very, very difficult bringing someone back down because they don't have the energy. You can't pick someone yeah. up and carry them. You just the can't. Helicopters can't go they can't go that high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so I remember when I saw this poor chap lying there, he was lying with his arms outstretched like this, almost as if he was reaching for help. And... I remember looking at his eyes were shut and the thing that just, that stuck with me he's he had long hair and his hair was frozen solid and the guy was like frozen solid like a rock and I just thought I'm never you're never going to see your family that's it there's no second chance that's it game over for you but for me when I saw that it was probably the biggest kick up the ass you can ever get because I was so tired and so fatigued that every time I stopped I would say to Doji Doji Give me, uh, just give me five seconds. Give me a, give me 30 second break. 
And as soon as I stopped and was like trying to catch my breath, I was, I was kind of drifting in and out of consciousness. And if it wasn't for Dorji, I would have just, that would have been me gone. So, so the if, next you go, if you go unconscious, you're dead because there's only one man there couldn't carry you down? Basically, yeah. Unless you woke up and suddenly had the energy to get back down. Um, so the next thing I knew was this whack around the face. And it was Dorji saying, move, move. And... You know, it's funny because it usually takes about two days to get from the summit of Everest back down to base camp, but it took me four days. I was able to sleep in some of the camps, but I really struggled on the way back down. Now, when I got home, I didn't know at the time, but I had pneumonia. So descending Everest with, with that is a bit of a problem. And that's what caused uh, me to have a very difficult descent of Everest. Um, but I'll tell you one thing that I learned over those few days of descending Everest and that is and I know Dick Goggins has talked about this many times and other people so I don't want to repeat too much but I'll tell you something when you think you are at your limit that you're not even close honestly 60, 40. I, I, I believe in that the reason why I believe in that is because I've experienced that yeah. when I was descending Everest I was able to you, when you're either going to die or you have to keep going you'll be amazed at what you can do yeah. you will and uh, yeah now I, I keep reminding myself because i fall victim to this now like i've had a long day you might have been up 24 hours and you think oh i'm tired oh but i'm telling you you've got you've got another couple of days in you before you just drop down and, yeah. and stop but that's the mindset isn't it? Uh, we're living yeah. in such a fragile world yeah. where it's so easy to be successful because everybody's so weak. Do you know what I mean? And yes. Goggins calls it the 60-40. Yeah. There's a few people call yeah. it the 60-40 because if you give 100%, that's flatline, you're dead. Uh, yeah. So they say yeah. when you think you've given 100%, you've got another 60% uh, to and go. I, and I'll tell you what, I couldn't agree more. He mm. is, and everyone who says that is, is correct. That that I think it's that Navy SEAL thing, isn't it, where they say the 60-40. Mm -hmm. And I'm no Navy SEAL guy. I'm not into any of that. But I can tell you that they are absolutely correct. Um, 100%. I've, so that I've never gives been you so that close. strong mindset then, that mentality not to quit? Or well, not to give I up couldn't and... quit then because um, I'd be dead if I didn't get, if I did not get back down mm -hmm. to, to base camp and able, I would be dead. What did your mum and dad said when you said, I'm going to claim Everest? They must have been like, for fuck's sake, take a rest, go back to work. <laughs> You know what, they, uh, my mum was not happy, but my dad encouraged me and said, go for it, do yeah. it. I think they really Because you were happy? Yes, and that's all, this is the thing that I try to tell kids, don't, if you don't like something, there will be times when you have to do things that you're not that keen on, that's just part of life. But if you're pursuing something because someone else has told you that's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. or you think it's the right thing to do, but you don't really like it, but you're doing it anyway, you're only going to last so long, you, yeah. you know? And so I'd found something that I really enjoyed and, and I managed to get back. I mean, Everest was incredible. A lot of people ask me what's my favorite country and Nepal would be one of my favorite countries because I've been out there a couple of times. Very spiritual. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I tried to climb another mountain out there and failed. I didn't get to the top. It's called Amadab Lam. What about K, quite, is it K2? That's in, uh, I think that's in yeah, Pakistan. That's, yeah, that's that, the second biggest. That's on another level. Why but, though yeah. if Everest is the biggest? Well, biggest, biggest is not the best. It's actually, okay, Everest is actually very, technically, it's very easy. It's not no, technical it is, at all. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not a difficult climb. You just need to have that ability to be able to acclimatize and just push yourself. If you're someone who, who's got some grit and you are able to push yourself, it's not that difficult i don't think but because it's not that technical and actually i'd already climbed everest and this was in 2012 i went out back to nepal with a few friends to climb another mountain and blow me down i got i became unwell and everest is 8848 meters so everest is everest is nearly 30000 feet mm -hmm. it's a long way up and i was trying to climb another mountain that's around 7000 meters so a lot you know near as high and I got, you know, I became unwell and couldn't get to the top. And I got to the top of Everest not because I was some badass hard guy. I got to the top of Everest because a lot of things came together for I me. I wouldn't discredit yourself though, because to sail around the Atlantic, to fly around the world on a plane, <laughs> and to climb Everest, uh, you've clearly got some kind of. That's a bit psychotic as well, but you've also <laughs> got belief. 
You've got to be fucking crazy to do it. Yeah. To be extreme, you are extreme. So I wouldn't discredit yourself and say it's phenomenal what you've done and what, you, what you're that. achieving. As it's, I've always you see Everest and you see the films. They make it a lot scarier than the actually what it really is. But to achieve what you're doing and and especially around the world in a gyroplane, it's unbelievable. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, you should yeah. be proud, man. <laughs> so when you've done Everest. So Were you thinking, up, what was your thought process after okay, that? So Back to the office? Or? Well, I then, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you a funny story, um, if we have time. Yeah, I, there's no rush, man. Oh, cool. No rush. So I managed to get back to, to Heathrow, um, but I, was, I couldn't breathe. I was really struggling, okay? And I had to have some assistance to get off the plane. And it was quite worrying, because still at this point, I didn't quite know what was wrong. And I remember seeing my my mum my and dad came to the airport and uh, I saw my mum's little face through the crowd of people and I kind of like waved to her. And you have to, I think there's, some, there's pictures in the book, you'll see my face is in a bad way, <laughs> all burnt up uh, due to the, 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 the atmosphere is very thin out there, uh, that high up, so you burn very easily and despite using cream and stuff. And I didn't look that good. And I remember I saw my mum, I waved at my mum and, and she's, the first thing she said to me was, James, you look awful. And I'm like, oh, it's great to see you. <laughs> and, um, but so I couldn't even push my trolley with the bags on because I was really struggling with my breathing. So she said, I think we better go to the doctors. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's go. So we didn't drive home. We drove straight to the doctor. And the doctor said, listen, mate, just go to the hospital now. I can see you know I'm well. So we went, okay. So I went to the hospital and the doctor x-rayed my chest and he put up this x-ray on a big whiteboard and he said, look at all these spots on your lungs. You, you've got quite a severe lung infection. The fact that you were on Everest not long ago and you're, sudden, you're back here now, do you know how lucky you are? And I was like, oh, okay, great. And I said, give me some antibiotics and I'll go home. And he's like, no, no, you need to stay here. You, you know, you're, you're unwell. So the day I got back from Everest was the day that I then spent almost two weeks in hospital. And it was like a feeling of deja vu, sort of having been there with the motorbike accident. Mm -hmm. And it was funny because I remember lying in that bed and two things happened to me okay one was probably uh was, 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 was i remember was, was quite embarrassing and uh as i had a basically i had a, 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 wart, a wart on the like a very bad kind of like spot this thing was i picked it up on everest because routine and using wet wipes to stay clean and and things is is essential you have to do that and you have to Why? have the discipline to do that because if you it's and it's, if you get, um, you know, you pick up an infection or something because you haven't kept yourself clean, mm. that's then going to ruin your chances of achieving what it is that you want to achieve. And it's, it's quite likely it might affect other people that are around you as well. So um, at base camp, you can, what there's like sort of portable shower type things, but higher up, you're just using wet wipes to keep mm -hmm. yourself clean and stuff. So I'm using wet wipes, but for some reason I developed this, sort of thing on the, the around my coccyx which is basically the crack of your bum so i remember i didn't know that i, I just knew that it was very painful and i remember I, I i couldn't even lie flat in the bed because it was it was so painful and um i remember i said to the doctor can you can we get an x-ray or something on that because it's really painful and he said yeah yeah sure and so i came back and said there's, there's nothing wrong with you and but he said to me let me send someone in and have a look at you. And he had this like grin on his face. And I thought, oh, that's strange. I wonder why he would have a grin on his face. Anyway, I thought nothing of it. So I'm sitting there, my parents are there and we're just relaxing. And, and I'm the only guy in the ward at this time, all right? And the door opens and the most stunning junior doctor, Brunette, that you've, the most stunning woman you've seen in your life, right? <laughs> she walks in and stands at the end of the bed and she says to me, James, and she said this whilst putting latex gloves on and twanging them in a seductive way. She said to me, James, I'm here to inspect you, roll over. So I'm dying with embarrassment. Mm -hmm. like my parents are sat right next to me, so it's horribly embarrassing. And um, she flings back the covers and I'm not really wearing anything. So it's, and she's like, just roll over, I've seen it all before. So I roll over and she's like, James, you've got the biggest wart I've ever seen, but don't worry, I'll burst it. And I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. It's really embarrassing. But she keeps this really intense eye contact with me. 
And so she's putting her gloves in the bin and she walks around to the, the end of the bed while staring into my eyes, smiling at me. And I thought, wow, bloody hell. Well, I've rode the Atlantic and I've climbed Everest, you know. If you don't know, if you don't try, you don't know. So I slipped her a card. And, and but I never heard from her again. So <laughs> that was like the most mm-hmm. embarrassing situation mm-hmm. I've ever been in. Mm-hmm. But something else happened to me in hospital as well. And I, I couldn't get this thought out of my head. I thought to myself, wouldn't it be a great idea to cycle around the world? So I decided I'd kind of fallen in and it kind of happened over time as well. But when I got back from Everest, I kind of had started to fall into a slightly different life. Um, in order to go out to Everest, I had to leave my job. So I took a massive risk um, just leaving my job. I didn't have a penny to my name. But when I got back from that, uh, the scouts asked if I wanted to become an ambassador for them. I was kind of doing it already, speaking in schools and things. And I had I managed to capture some amazing footage out on Everest and also out in, in the, as I rode across the Atlantic as well. And I was, I, I was doing a lot of talks. I wasn't really thinking about it. I was just doing them. And initially they were started in schools and then I was doing more with companies and things. And then, you know, people were starting to pay me and wanted me to come and do more and more and more. And I thought, you know what? I don't really know where this is going to go, but I like this. I'm really happy. I like it. It's not work. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. And so I thought, right, I'm going to cycle around the world. I knew someone had cycled around the world and he kind of inspired me, actually. I thought it was a pretty cool thing to do. And I thought, you know what? I, I, I'm not trying to do it in no record time or anything. I'm just going to cycle around the world. And what I'm going to do is speak in a school in every single country I pass through. I don't know why, but young people seem to listen to me. I'm able to connect with young people mm-hmm. quite well. And so that is what I did. And um, it took, I mean, I could talk to you for ages about cycling around the world, but I met some incredible people. I, I cycled 100 miles a day for half a year. And it sounds like a lot, but it's not that big a deal. Once you get out there. How did you plan that out? Well, um, I actually already kind of had an idea. There's was there another chap, a Scottish chap, actually, who you, you're probably into. His name's Mark Beaumont. He's, mm-hmm. he's a pretty, pretty amazing cyclist. He'd already cycled around the world. So I kind of mirrored his route, actually. Um, and it sounds daft, but you just, you, you, you're looking on Google Maps and stuff and you're planning stuff out through that. And the reality is when you're out there doing it, quite often or not you're you're just literally on your you will be amazed at how useful google maps really is but go once you're out of a major a major city quite often or not it's only one or two roads that you need to follow and there's signs any it's danger not at any point yeah in india i had a guy point a gun at me um, but that was just a, a problem with communication because i think i was trying to sleep somewhere where perhaps i shouldn't have been trying to sleep and if I had been able to communicate with that guy, he would have said to me, come on in, I'll cook, I'll make you dinner. But it, he was getting frustrated because he couldn't understand me and, and I couldn't understand him. So in the end, I'm like, oh, I've got to go. It, it so was six months, 100, 100 miles a day. Yeah. What is the earth? Is it 24,000 miles? Yeah, yeah. To so to, to I had to fly out. It's a fly, so we'll talk about that later. I had to cycle 18,000 miles mm-hmm. um, and cross the equator twice did you have um, to well, so when you get boats and stuff what happens there just no no nothing you know i've lost so many people say oh do you pedal on the plane ha 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 but no yeah. <laughs> there's, there's none of that you you are allowed to use public transport you have to um but you basically you, need, you get smart asses saying do you pedal on the plane and yeah. stuff yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> yeah i was like yeah i did do that yeah. or do you have to get a boat and uh, pedal on the boat Ped, do you pedal around yeah. the boat and i'm like yeah just to get to different yeah. like continents do you, uh, yeah, so you just fly. yeah you just yeah you just you're allowed to fly mm-hmm. you can just pack your bike up you fly there and then it starts again from the airport yeah yeah or it, yeah you, you can you know, most of the time it was from the airport yeah, yeah you just get unpack the bike and just go so as long as your total mileage was more than eighteen thousand miles mm-hmm. you, you that, that's it um so yeah it was incredible the people that i met was amazing um cycling across um i tell you what cycling across australia was incredible why well wildlife nature it was yeah the wildlife and nature was was interesting but i'll tell you something i had all these ideas of seeing all this crazy um dangerous wild animals so you didn't see anything I, i i couldn't find a deadly uh, spider or snake if I wanted to find one 
Um, they, probably, they probably were out there, but I couldn't find any. Mm. Um, but I remember f cycling across the uh, the famous Nullarbor Plain. It was like, it's, it's, about, it's basically like the outback and it stretches for about seven or 800 miles is this particular stretch. Mm -hmm. And there's only really one way across Australia. It's one road. So you can't get lost unless you're a right idiot. You know, you just got to follow it. And uh, a lot of people said to me, like, how are, you, how are you getting across Australia? And I'd say, well, you know, going across the Nullarbor. And they'd say, no way. That's so dangerous, man. You know, truck drivers, they deliberately ram cyclists off the road and stuff. And I'm like, no, they don't do that. And it was interesting. All these people, well-meaning people, by the way, were saying to me, I really don't think you should do that. It's very dangerous. It, it could end in disaster. Actually, you know what? When I got out there, it was a complete opposite. I, I felt really safe. There were big road trains and things, but they, they pull over and they give you loads of space. I met other people cycling across. I met one lunatic running across with a support car. Mm -hmm. And like people couldn't do more i had people pulling over saying do you want some water do you want yeah. some food and it's like do you have a set amount of calories you need to eat per day you just eat what you can do you like you will come back ripped to the bone mm -hmm. um because you, it's very similar to the row um and a lot of people said when you rode the atlantic you must have come back like arnold schwarzenegger i'm like no it's the opposite you waste away and yeah. it's similar with you but you'll get ripped um so you would just eat everything anything and everything you you physically cycle around the world was a was a world eating challenge if i'm honest you're constantly looking for the next meal um and you stay de dehydrated all the time yeah you got it you got to you got to try and keep on top of your hydration stuff but in what will happen that's quite interesting is you'll get to a point where you get quite fit and then you don't get any fitter because in order to get fitter you need rest days and you need correct nutrition i was just smashing any old crap that i could get yeah. in because it was there it was quick it was easy and then boom off i went again what did your mum and dad say about that adventure no they 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 support it was, it? No. yeah they, they, they were do you know what this is what he wants yeah, to do I'll let them do it they were actually quite supportive they were very good um actually they came out to meet me in lisbon and when i was mm -hmm. that's my where last. did you start from so i started from greenwich park and then from greenwich park i went to, down i had some mates join me and I, I cycled down to dover and then i got the ferry across to calais and then i went through calais uh, down through uh, France, uh, Belgium, Netherlands, Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey. And I was going to route through Iran and Pakistan, um, but it, it got a bit complicated in the end. So I, was, I actually flew to, to India um, and then I flew down, uh, cycled down to Sri Lanka. I did, cycled a, a lap of Sri Lanka, which was incredible. Then I came back into India because I was working with a charity, raising some money for young girls out in India who are, are trafficked. It's a very big problem out there. So I was trying to help raise awareness and stuff for, for those guys. And then from there, I actually flew to Bangkok. And then from there, I cycled uh, down through Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore, and that was amazing beautiful climate the people were friendly the roads ain't fucking friendly though i, I was okay why well i never had any problems did you have a helmet knee pads oh, anything no no i had a helmet i always yeah. had a helmet on um, big rucksack no no I, I actually traveled very very light i had what you call frame bags so i was carrying stuff but i didn't have massive panniers sleeping in hotels camping outside what we did a bit of both a bit yeah. of both um i was able to sleep in hotels and stuff where when i could um, and when i cycled across america i used a website called warmshowers.org be careful if you google that by the way but it's uh <laughs> it's actually everybody <laughs> pissing on each other <laughs> it's actually a website that's set up for people to host cyclists so let's say you live somewhere in america a uh, phoenix for example mm -hmm. and this happened to me i found a guy on on warm showers and i said hey you know, i'm cycling around the world can i come and stay and it was like yeah yeah of course you can so in fact i was in california at the time and i said i'll be with you tonight and he said james that's 160 miles you won't and he couldn't believe it when i knocked on his door at 10 o'clock at night and um anyway so i was able to sometimes utilize accommodation just well-meaning people who wanted to welcome travelers uh -huh. into their house uh, in exchange for some stories you know they feed you and you you tell them a bit but here's the thing that's complicated about that when you're on the road and you've got commitments to fill emails to reply things to organize 
like you've just cycled a whole day and you're, you're, you're quite tired. So then you have to socialize and make an effort for like two or three hours repeating the same stories and then the work can start. So sometimes it was easier just to pay the money and check into a cheap hotel because I, I, I didn't have any distractions. I was able to get the work done that I needed to do, then move on to the next day. But having said that, the balance of meeting people was just amazing. I, I, probably one of the things that stands out to me when I cycled around the world is, well, it was a bit of a crazy place at the moment, but I'll tell you what, you know, it, it doesn't matter, what, you know, what skin color you have, it doesn't matter what religion you practice, doesn't matter what country you're from. I would say 99.99% of people that roam the face of this earth are actually kind, caring, and they do want to help you. I had so many people uh, give, give me random acts of kindness yeah. to me. I will be playing forward favors yeah. for the rest of my life. I, I really will. There, yeah. were, there were so many people yeah. that were so good. And, so that was the ultimate triathlon done. You're the only person in the world to do that? To do those three things. Yeah. yeah, there's loads of people that have rode an ocean. Yeah, but amateurs, amateurs. Fucking amateurs. But yeah, to, to so do that where it started. Things. So when you flew around the world in a gyroplane, how yeah. did that come about? Yeah, I'll tell you how about well, I'll tell you what, there's a few things that happened before that actually. Tell me, bro. Tell me. Yeah, and so there I was. I i kind of I got back to Greenwich Park and you know, and I, there was quite a lot of media and stuff. Mm -hmm. I did it was quite lucky. I didn't really anticipate it, but it was blown away. And then I wrote the book and stuff. And and then I, an opportunity came up to to row uh, across the Indian Ocean with an amazing guy. Um, and he approached me before um, I cycled around the world. And he said, "Listen, I want to row across the Indian Ocean." And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I fully condone it." Let, do it and he was like i want to do it with you and i'm like ah i'm a little bit busy at the moment but perhaps we can pick this up when i get back and you know by this point i was getting quite a lot of people come to me saying can you help me i want to do this i want to do that and i always reply to everyone because i wouldn't be where i am today if it wasn't for the people that helped me mm -hmm. and this guy he was different he just instead of like just talking about it he went out there and and he did it he he started putting together a website he started learning how to row he started trying to seek funding and every time i told him to do something he would come back to me and say i, I i've completed that what do i do now and i thought bloody hell this guy's this guy obviously wants this and so i, I did a bit more investigations if it were but we knew each other through through the scouts um because i was doing some stuff with the scouts and, and so was he and it turns out he had an incredible story. He, he had, um, he nearly died of, of cancer, Hodgkin's lymphoma at, at 19 years old. It was his third round of chemo that saved the guy. And he had epilepsy ever since he was a young boy. And his whole life, he just wanted to, to prove to people that you can do things if, if you put your mind to it. And you know, when you get a gut feeling that just something feels right, it felt right. So I, I said, Ash was his name. So I said to him, yeah, let's do it. Um, so, I remember we we got the, the we managed to get the funding. We were very very lucky. We got funded by a family who uh, were putting quite a bit of money into epileptic research, and and they liked what we were doing and why we were doing it. So we got a boat. This time we got a much newer boat than what I had mm -hmm. when I rode the Atlantic. It was all carbon. It was it was very nice. So we got it out to a place called Geraldton, which is Western Australia, just north of Perth. And the mission was to row. Uh, to Mauritius. Now that's 4,000 miles. So it's quite a long way to row anyway. And it's a different beast to the Atlantic. You don't necessarily benefit from the prevailing winds quite so much. You really do have to row. And it's going to, it's likely that it will be, you're going to experience some bad weather as well. Like if you go across the Atlantic at the right time of year, you can be pretty sure you'll get okay weather. You're not going to get a hurricane. You're not going to get anything too bad unless you're really unlucky. But the Indian Ocean is a bit more volatile. It's not rowed so much. And we knew that it was going to be difficult. Um, but we, and we knew it was going to be a challenge. So, you know, Ro Ash was incredible. He, I felt a bit sorry for him because he, 
he lost a lot of weight during his chemo so he was very very thin and people would say people would kind of laugh a little bit and say how, how are you going to row across the indian ocean there's nothing to you mate you've got no muscle but the muscle he had was all up here Mental. he was one of the strongest guys very very quiet and unassuming guy but he mentally was nails and and he had no real experience i was the guy with the experience mm -hmm. but what he did have what he had was so useful he had that drive that energy and that enthusiasm and i try to tell kids don't worry if you're not quite sure how to do something you can always find out but having some drive and some get up and go will take yeah. you such a long way and belief yeah, exactly belief is everything you can if you get into the jungle you the lion is the is the king of the jungle not because it's the biggest or the smartest or the fastest it's the king of the jungle because it believes it's the king of the jungle Absolutely. when a lion roars everybody else runs so, <laughs> yeah. do you know what i mean and and there's other animals there that can destroy it it can beat it it's, yeah. it's just because it's belief yeah it's crazy so he, he believed that he could do it and we knew that we could and so to cut a long story short we were we were quite you know we were a couple of weeks out and we got a, a little bit unlucky we got caught in some quite nasty weather um we were, we were you're talking 50 to 60 knots so that's about 70 mile an hour of winds and when you're in a tiny little boat that's probably the length of a, a, a normal family car and you're in an ocean with 70 to 80 mile an hour winds that's not a good place to be and you know, waves really do break in the middle of an ocean they don't just break at the beach and the boat like i said is designed to self right and so as long as you stay in it, you'll be okay. Do you strap yourself in? Yeah, so feel? you had to, basically, we're sort of, both Ash and I, by this point, once the, the, once this huge area of low pressure started to work its way through us, there was nothing we could do. We couldn't outrun it. We had to go through it. And I knew that this weather was coming because the weather router called me on the satellite phone. That's never a good thing. So <laughs> it, there was nothing I could do. So we had to go straight through this. So we tied everything mm -hmm. down and you've secured the boat as, as best as you can. And you are safe. You're not not safe uh, as long as you stay in the boat. And and But it's to try and explain what it's like it's like being in a small little kind of coffin you can't really there's limited space to sit Can you up. see out yeah so the hatch has a it's kind of like see-through to it to a degree so you can see out but in rough weather you can't have the hatch open because waves will come crashing Sink into the, the cabin and, and soak everything so you have to have the the hatch shut now you do have these vents but they don't work that well so the air goes very stale very quickly and the best way to describe what it's like it's like being in a, a sauna you can't and but you can't open the door Is it's, it warm? Oh, it's so hot inside it's torture so so hot and you, and every now and then you can open the hatch to let some fresh air come in and it kind of cools Is that you when a waste crash is yeah inevitably that. it always comes as yeah. you open the, you get soaked and we knew that there was a good chance that the boat was probably gonna uh, roll over and uh, yeah, unfortunately, the boat did, did did roll over, and we got caught in in, in quite a, a nasty one. And what happened was, the boat sort of pitch poled and 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 went over. And as it went over, I was okay, but Ash was thrown, and um, and he hit his head. And unfortunately, we had a bit of a medical uh, problem on on board the boat. So at that point, the row was over because he the priority was safety um so how did you get home so here's the difficult part how do you get rescued in the middle of an ocean so you'll activate something called an epurb which is an emergency positioning indicating radio beacon and no matter where if it's a uk registered vessel which which we were that no matter where you are in the world that signal will go back to falmouth uh falmouth coast guard back in the south of england they will coordinate the rescue so I also called them on the sat phone and explained what had happened. Um, now, luckily, there was a commercial vessel that was within, oh, I can't remember how long, it was within 24 hours of us. And it was called the Dubai Charm. And it, this thing was a crude oil tanker. So it's an oil tanker, basically. It was two hundred, nearly 300 meters long, just under. Uh, it was 100,000 tons in, in weight. And it was about 70 to 80 feet just to get up to the deck. But the problem that you've got is how do you transition from a tiny little boat in high winds? You're getting blown all over the place. The boat is 
you, you're at risk of it rolling over again, mm -hmm. you've somehow got to come up alongside this gigantic piece of metal that's so big you cannot comprehend it unless you're actually there looking up at it. And you've got to somehow get on top. It's it would be easy if it was a flat, calm day. They would send. They would. There's a proper metal ladder, ladder that folds down. It would be easy peasy. Mm -hmm. But but this wasn't. So Ash, we as we got closer to it, um, what actually happened? Because we couldn't row the boat to them. They had to bring this tanker right up to us, and that was scary. Looking up at it because we didn't want to get run over by it. The propellers under it could that suck they, you in or anything? The, well, they would. By the time they got to us, they were probably not Stop. even running. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there were deck sort of workers on the deck throwing ropes down. But by the time these massive thick ropes were hitting our boat that had been thrown from 70 or 80 feet above, they were like missiles. <laughs> and so if they'd hit you, it would have knocked yeah. you out. So we were trying to avoid these ropes that were being thrown down. Eventually, I got one tied onto the boat and Ash... Because Ash was epileptic, we couldn't run, and he luckily regained consciousness at this point, so we couldn't run the risk of him climbing up a little ladder in case he fell off it. And if he fell off it, that's gone. No one's going to be able to get him. Mm -hmm. And so he was incredibly brave, actually. He actually had to get into a harness, and they dropped a rope down. Um, but the, the rope that they dropped down to winch him up was getting tangled in some of the mess of other ropes that they'd thrown down as well. I like to throw so many ropes down. Uh, just trying to get them on tied to the boat to secure it. Yeah. But they also threw this netting down. Now, that was a pain because the netting caught on the gate where the oars are, which kind of sticks out from the side of the boat. So what was happening... The, the massive tanker was sitting still in the water, but we were rising up and down as the waves were going up and down, and the netting was catching the boat. So as the boat would, as we, as the boat would fall, where it was catching on the netting, it would be trying to turn us over. Mm -hmm. So we had to cut all the netting free to stop that from happening. Then they, the deck workers could see what was happening, so they pulled the netting up and got it out of the way. But this left a mess of ropes and crap. And, and if you got tangled up in that, that's very, very dangerous. Very big problem. Yeah. So Ash got into a harness and, and he had a life jacket on and we got the rope down, but he had to jump free of the rowing boat in order to be pulled up free of any ropes that would tangle him. And to it goes against what you will want to do. You, your mind won't let you just jump off a boat. You won't want to naturally do that. But he was tied on and connected to the to the rope and one uh, one minute i remember just looking at him and he jumped off the back of the boat into the water and there must have been five or six guys on the end of this rope he's a small guy anyway but he shot up like a rag doll <laughs> i mean there must have been so many guys mm -hmm. pulling that rope so as soon as i saw him flying up it was like a relief. I knew he, he, he was, was safe. safe. And it was funny because what happened, I was looking at him and as soon as I turned to look at the boat, it was like it was meant to be. The rope ladder just dangled right in front of my face. And you know when you're driving a car, you swerve. You don't think about it. You swerve if something comes out in front of you. It's just your instant reaction. Well, my instant reaction, I didn't think. I just leapt off the boat onto the ladder. And as I grabbed the ladder, I remember I was hold. I've never held anything so tight in my life, trust me. And I looked down and my boat had just dropped away below me. And there I was like hanging on the side of this crude oil tanker thinking, shit. And then again, adrenaline takes over. That's an incredible thing that is. And then I was able to get to the top. And then what happened was quite odd after that because it was an Indian crew and bearing in mind that this was a crude oil tanker, so they're carrying tons and tons of crude oil, I asked to see the captain up in the bridge to thank him for coming to our aid. Okay, so this, this thing is so big, you get in a lift to go to the top. And so we're up on the bridge and there's this huge metal door and I push the metal door to go in, right? And the, the bridge, it's thick with smoke. And there is the captain with this huge smile on his face with a cigarette and all his crew with a cigarette in their hand and a pack of beers. And he looks at me with a big smile on his face and he says, whoa, that was crazy. <laughs> Here you go. Mm -hmm. And just passes me a beer. Mm -hmm. And they're all smoking away. It's, it was really surreal. surreal what happened. Yeah. And then 
uh, three days later, we were back in. It was on its that particular vessel was on its way to Melbourne, but it stopped off in Perth um, and and dropped us off, and, and we were okay. But this was global news, and to be honest, this was quite a tough time for me because I thought, shit, I'd lost all my credibility. I'd failed Ash. I'd let myself down. I'd let everyone down. This feel you're a big thing for you because I know you're talking about Everest. You never failed to get your funding. And now you're talking about that, you feel as if you've let people down, but you can't think that way because of Correct, you can't you, think all the shit that you've achieved. There's yeah. going to be failures. Yeah. 99% of success yeah. is failures. Fail, 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 yeah. fail until you succeed. But something crazy happened off the back of it, which mm. I didn't expect and I didn't see coming. So I kind of went home feeling, eventually got back to the UK, feeling pretty demoralized and like, like I said, let everyone down. But then my phone was ringing off the hook. People were ringing me up saying, you're the bloke that was on TV that was rescued, right? I said, yeah, that was me. They said, great, can we book you to speak at our event? I said, uh, yeah, of course you can. They weren't interested in, in, in Everest and other bits and bobs. The success. They wanted to know what it was like to fail and be rescued. Yeah. And they were like, well, what was that like? What did you learn? How did, how, what's it like to be rescued? What happened to your boat? Unfortunately, that boat was lost. We, it was, we were unable to retrieve it. So that, that was lost. It's, it could well be out there now. Still floating around. The boat was called the James Lewis. Yeah, and uh, that could still well be out there now, somewhere in the mm -hmm. Indian Ocean. It's never been found. Um, yeah, so then off the back of that, I came home, and what I thought was this really dark cloud of disappointment, but it actually ended up having an incredible silver lining. Um, I was being booked for more speaking events. People wanted to know what it was like, and then I had an opportunity to come up off the back of that to go out to the jungle uh, in Brazil to the Amazon and do some filming with a guy and that would have never happened off the back of that to do what? well he, had, he ran a travel company at the time and they basically took people out into the jungle to give them kind of like jungle experiences all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff and so I went out there with him to help make some videos to promote the company and stuff. And, and he actually, he was an ex uh, Royal Marine, a really nice guy, older guy. And we got on really well. And this guy was a jungle warfare instructor. So there was no better person to go out to the Amazon with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were only out there for a few weeks, but that was, that was incredible. But then another opportunity came up as well. And... An, op an opportunity came up in 2016 to, to take a guy across the Atlantic. Um, he was it's a bit of an older guy. Um, he'd been very successful his whole life. He worked very hard and, and he basically just wanted a bit of an adventure. But he only really had about 30 days to spare. And so he wanted to cross the Atlantic. He didn't want to sail. He liked the idea of sort of rowing across. But yeah. the problem that you've got is I couldn't guarantee that you'd get across in 30 days if that's all the time that you have. So we were working with a, a company that made these like specialist boats. And so we ended up having a pedalo, a custom pedalo made. And um, we, we, we decided that we were going to cross the Atlantic, the, same, the very same route that I yeah, rode. Pedaling. We were going to take this guy across in a pedalo. It is, this is not the type of thing you no would see. Pedalos in Ibiza Beach, uh, like yeah, the yellow ones with the yeah, shoot yeah, in the yeah, back. This is no swan on the front yeah, with yeah, the, yeah. the slide. This mm. thing is really badass. You know, it's very, very well designed. But we had a little bit of a secret weapon as well. And that was, uh, we wanted to make sure that we could get across in the, in the required time. So... He didn't want to sail, but we thought well, we're going to need to harness something mm -hmm. to give us a bit of an advantage. So we ended up utilizing a kite design. And, and so we had a custom pedalo made with a recumbent cycling position, but it also had a rowing position as well if we wanted to row. But actually the cycling position and the propeller was a model airplane propeller mm -hmm. and it was incredibly efficient. Just cycling, we were able to go a lot faster than we were rowing. It was it was very How smart. How much your legs then? Did yeah. they get stronger? Did, did they get bigger? Yeah, but it's you're doing it at such a gentle pace. Yeah, so it's you're not. not like you're a just. You're, no, no. You're, if your heart rate is elevated, you're going too hard. Yeah. You just gently, gently. So why did you make the transition from the ground, the sea, to the sky? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll come onto that in two seconds. Mm -hmm. Um, because there's a few things that happened before the, the flight around the world. Mm -hmm. um, Anthony and I were going to cross the, the, the Atlantic in the pedalo, and, and things were going really well. We were halfway across. Mm -hmm. and earlier on, you asked me what happens if you become unwell, and the answer is there, there is things that you can do. Anthony had a, a medical problem, so I had to orchestrate another rescue, and I thought, I mean, what's the chances of this happening again? Mm -hmm. 
Um, but but it was something I had to do. So again, I had to activate an EPIRB and orchestrated a rescue. And he was he was fine in the end. He, luckily, he was he was Is okay. That two unwell men though just want to push themselves to the limits. No, no, no. What happened with Ash was very a was freak just just, just unlucky. Yeah. yeah, and he he yeah. How did you get rescued this time? Uh, exactly in exactly the same way. Oil tanker? No, this was a crude or uh, sorry, this was a bulk carrier, but it's the same, the same type of huge mm -hmm. vessel. So this was the second yeah. time I've been How rescued. How were you feeling feel, after that? Uh, I was feel feel. No, let me tell you something. Right, I was really anxious at the, the recovery and our rescue because I knew how dangerous it was. Whereas Anthony was quite calm. Mm -hmm. um, but he, um, once we were safely on the boat in their medical kind of room, if you like, he was like, oh my God, that was so dangerous. And and the, the transition from a tiny little boat onto these things is, is deadly. If you <laughs> fall off, just, you're yeah. gone. And I knew that, but he didn't. Uh, luckily he didn't, but he, he was fine. And he, he, he ended up getting back home. And I did say to the guy, do you want to do it again? What happened was very, very unlucky. Uh, at the moment, he's he's not sure, but he won an adventure, and boy, did uh, he get one! Mm -hmm. So it all, all worked well. So I thought to myself, you know what? I better work on something on my own. Um, so I decided because yeah, the ones you've done in your own, basically, you've succeeded. Not yeah, I to think bring it's just anyone luck. down, yeah, there, yeah, but just, just how it's been, right? Yeah. So I thought, right, I'm. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to work on a project to row a boat around the coast of Great Britain as a solo guy. I'll do it on my own. No one had achieved that. To, to, uh, at the time and it's quite technical because the most dangerous place to be in a boat is at, especially a boat that doesn't have an engine is right next to the coast um, and so it was very technical I, I had to and tactical so I had to utilize the tide because the tide turns every six hours so that would pull me along and then I'd have a break and then I'd, I'd row very close to the coast so I would physically drop an anchor to the bottom to secure the boat then pull it up and carry on. It's easier to row across the Atlantic than it is to row around Great Britain in which people don't get their head around but it really is. So anyway, I kind of made it happen. I was really prepped for this. I'd done all the research. I'd, I trained hard and blow me down uh, a week into the row, I become unwell myself and get a bladder infection and have to be taken off the boat. And I'm thinking, everything I'm touching is just going wrong. And, and actually I went through a period of, of, of feeling really quite down. I was questioning- Blessed. Whether, yeah, I would say so. I was questioning whether I was gonna carry on doing what I was doing. And, you know, I had a lot of people uh, say, you've had a good run, give this crap up, go and get a real job. <laughs> yeah, I did. And, and I thought, you know what? One of the things that I've learned over the years is to stand up for the things that you believe in, your values and your beliefs and the things that make you happy and just, just do them. And I thought I could easily get another job if I wanted to, but I don't want to, I want to, I want to do the things that I like to do that make me happy. Uh, I was doing a lot of, of work with kids speaking in schools and things. And, and I really, really enjoyed that. And yeah, I'd had, you know, I was this guy who'd achieved all these seemingly impressive feats from, from the outside, but everything I was touching was going wrong. And I thought, you know what? I owe it to myself and all the people that had believed in me and supported me on my projects to to carry on and I'd actually always had an interest in flying ever since I was a, a kid but I didn't think that I would ever be able to fly I thought people who fly are people that are very intelligent and have lots of money and I fell very short on on both those but I thought you know what I'm gonna see what happens and I wanted to do something a little bit different I like being different so I thought I'm gonna learn how to fly gyro planes so a gyro plane it it might look like a helicopter because it has a set of rotors, mm -hmm. but the rotors are not powered. They spin via the air passing underneath them. It's called auto rotation. And you have an engine at the back, which turns a propeller that pushes you uh, forward. forward, correct. And I thought, you know what? I'm just gonna take it one step at a time and see how I get on. Do you need a license for that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do have to have a license. Yeah, yeah. So um, I was quite lucky. I picked up, I went for a one trial flight at my local airfield, uh, Popham, which is, is not far from Basingstoke. 
a great guy working there, very experienced guy called Steve, an amazing guy. So I had my trial flight and I thought, right, I loved it. And in fact, I was quite nervous actually. When I first went up, I was, I thought, bloody hell, this I'm quite exposed. And I remember he basically cut the engine when we were in the air to demonstrate that you can't stall, you'll never ever fall out of the sky with a, with a modern gyro. They just, they'll auto rotate. You can't stall them like you can a normal fixed wing aircraft. And I remember we were motoring along and just backed the power off and it felt like I wanted to fall off the edge. You know that feeling when you're at the top of a roller coaster, you're yeah, looking down the air and you're just about to go. Yeah. I felt like that, but we never did shoot down. Why does, why does that happen? Uh, just because the rotor above your head will continue to spin and you just start to slowly descend. You're gliding down. So they're incredible machines. And I remembered that. And I went home, I was all psyched up and I thought, right, I'm gonna learn how to fly. So I kind of like saved up and sort of organized my finances. It didn't cost a huge amount in the grand scheme of things. And I thought, I'm going to learn how to fly. So I, I did all my training with, with Steve and actually with another guy to begin with, but then eventually Steve. And then I was very lucky. I picked it up very quickly, I think, where I was... I used to race motorbikes. I, I still had good balance, I guess, yeah. and good coordination. I, I picked it up. I think I passed in pretty much the minimum time. I think you have to have a minimum of 45 hours before you can go for your test. And I think I passed on like 47. So I was really lucky. I just picked it up really quickly. What's the test like? The test, like a driving test. Must be pretty tunneling. Yeah, it's like a driving test. Yeah, the interesting one is when they cut the engine and say you have to make an emergency landing. They don't turn the engine off. They just back the power back. So it's not produce, you're, you're, you have to find a field quickly. But there's procedures that you have to go through. You have to select a field. You have to make a mayday call on the radio. You have to make sure the aircraft's turned into wind. How and, high can they go? Oh, man, I mean... When I flew around the world, I took mine up to about 13,000 feet. So they'll go high. The, the world's altitude record for a gyroplane, I think it's like 26, nearly 27,000 feet. So Is that no fucking orbit? That's high. Yeah. That's really high. In fact, the, the person who set that's a, a, a very small woman. So mm -hmm. she's quite light. And she flew the same type of aircraft that I flew. So you were never worried that the engine popped because you could still land. So what happens if you're going oversee and then you're going to get wet then you're in big trouble so when you're flying across oceans and water yeah if the engine goes bang you are getting wet but you've got to have a mindset but you're not dying possibly see it all depends how if you fast can, get, can they go about 100 mile an hour yeah that, that's not all bad so, speed so you can do about 100 mile yeah. an hour so if I'll come on and I'll talk about going yeah, around yeah. the world, but I'll answer your question about the, if you're going across long stretches of water, I opted to use an open cockpit gyro. That meant that if I was unfortunate enough to ditch in water, I wouldn't have to, the struggle of getting out of mm -hmm. a, an aircraft that has an enclosed cabin, which fills with water and I can't get out. So for safety, I thought it was better to run uh, an open cockpit gyro. And also when I flew across long sections of water, I had a special survival suit on. So if I was to go into the water, that would keep me buoyant and dry and hopefully keep me alive for a little bit longer. But the problem that, or the challenge that you have in the parts of the world where I was flying across, you know, Canada to Greenland and then Greenland to Iceland, you don't really have, the water's extremely cold. So if you end up going in that water, A, you've got to get out the aircraft without drowning, without it p t pulling you down. Mm -hmm. Then you've got to somehow survive. And, you know, I did carry a small little life raft with me under my left leg, which is a small little one man thing. But in my mind, I made a conscious decision that I was never gonna, I prepared for it. And I did some sea, sea drills and things to like get into the life raft and, and I prepared the best that I could. But I made a conscious decision that I was never going to worry about the engine stopping because it's a mindset. The aircraft doesn't know it's flying above water. It, it, the aircraft don't know where it is. It's only me that knows where I am. Mm -hmm. And there is no reason for that engine to stop. Um, it could do, but there's no reason for it to. And to do something like that that I suppose is quite daring and quite out there and quite risky you have to believe that you're going to be safe you have to believe that that engine's never going to stop and some people would say well you're a little bit naive because it could and I would say yeah it could 
but I believe it's not going to. Yeah. It's not going to. How did it take off? Straight up? No, no, no. So what you would do is you'd line up on the runway and you have what's called a pre-rotator. So you could spin up the rotors while you're on the ground. Mm -hmm. And then you're pointing down the runway. Usually the wind is blowing down the runway. Then you bring the stick back and then you'd put the power in and then you'd accelerate off uh, uh, down the runway. So it would take off like a conventional fixed wing aircraft. But what happens... Mm -hmm. Once you're going at a certain speed and the rotors start spinning up, that rotor effectively, look at it like it turns into a wing, okay? So you, you, it provides lift and off you go. And you, and you wanna turn left, you turn the stick to the left. The whole rotor head will tilt to the left or to the right. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna speed up, you push the stick forward and the whole rotor head will tilt forward. That's how you speed up. And if you want to slow down, you pull it back. But if you want to climb, you add more power. And that's how you, you, you climb up. How so, long did that take you? So it took, it took me to fly my aircraft around the world. I flew 24,000 nautical miles. And, and it took me 175 days. And it was probably one of the hardest things I've ever managed to do because it was quite stressful. It was, wasn't that easy. People said to me, that's going to be the easiest thing you've ever managed to do, right? It's got an engine, piece of piss. Did you but, sleep in that? Okay. No, well, you you don't sleep in it. You 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 fly, you, you make your flights throughout the day, and then in the evening you just check into a hotel somewhere. Um, but you're not just like randomly landing in fields and stuff. You have you you, you set out um, a plan, a, a route with with dedicated stops and things. You have to know that they've got fuel for you yeah. to use. Do you have to contact other airports to uh, yeah. tell them that you're landing? Yeah, and, yeah, and I, had a, I had a really good team back in the UK that were helping me line it all up and stuff. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, it was, and, and like the cycle, it was just amazing. Is that why the cycle was only 18,000 then? Because you had to travel overseas? Yeah, uh, well, okay. So actually, f to set the record that I set, I only needed to fly, it was just under 20,000. It was the uh, length of the uh, Tropic of Cancer, I believe. And so I, I did have to fly, there is a criteria to set an official world record. There is a criteria and I had to fly just under 20,000 nautical miles, or I think it was around 20,000. But I didn't want any, any kind of doubt or whether I've flown far enough. So I flew 24,000 nautical miles. But what I actually did was that I, when I, uh, entered um, America, I, I didn't just fly from the West Coast to the East Coast. Like I've cycled across America twice. And actually, I, I really like America. It's, you know, I, I've got a lot of friends there. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to land in every single state. So I zigzagged the whole way across America and I landed in all 49 mainland states. The only one I couldn't do was Hawaii because oh. I, I didn't have the range to get there. I'd run out and crash by, yeah. by the time I got there. But the, again, it, you know, I, it was the people that I met and I, I, I spoke in loads of different schools. And there was one in Siberia, there was a school where I spoke to some kids there and this one little girl just looked at me for about, while I was sharing stories and pictures and things, there was one little girl that sat there and just stared at me for an hour with this big smile on, my fa on her face. And I thought, you know what? She'll, I'll never see her again, but I hope she remembers the day that that British lunatic came in and was sharing stories of fun and adventure and, and stuff. It was, it was just absolutely incredible. Mm -hmm. and, I, I, and, and it was a crazy thing to do because people who fly around the world are typically people who've been flying their whole life. It's unheard of for someone to learn how to fly and then fly around the world. And, you know, I remember when I first kind of put it out there again, you know, I got quite a, you know, I got a few people saying, are you, are you absolutely out of your mind? Mm -hmm. But this is what you need to do. Surround yourself with the right people. So I went out and I was very lucky. I got, the, I had the right people around me who had a lot of experience. And they said, well, yeah, what you're trying to do is crazy. But if you do this, this, and this, and you break it down and you just take it one day at a time, you probably can do this. And sure enough, I was, yeah. I was the, the problem that you've got is it's not just flying. This is in everyday life. You gotta be careful because there's a lot of well-meaning people out there. And there's a lot of people who have experience in some things, but there will also be a lot of people that have a little bit of experience, but think they have a shitload more than they really do. Mm -hmm. 
And so you've got to be careful who you take advice from yeah. and find the people who are already doing yeah. what you're you want to do and are at the top yeah. of their game and because they're going to be doing something yeah, right sometimes it's best just to do something without even saying to anyone because yeah. people can project their fears onto you yeah. and speak you out of it because if <laughs> you were to listen to everyone you'd be yeah. still fucking working in an office uh, absolutely absolutely mm -hmm. so that's probably some of the biggest yeah. things that i've learned is so when you're done out when you've done all that what was your best moment what was a moment you really felt good? Out of everything. Yeah. Oh man, probably a moment that I really felt amazing was when I went back out to Nepal and, and spoke in a school there. I, and this was after I climbed Everest. That was, that was pretty good. And I think the things that actually make me quite happy are when I spend a couple hours in a school and a teacher will say, I don't know how you did that, but so-and-so has sat here for an hour and listened to you. And that, that person is then coming up to me saying, I want to do this, I want to do that. Well, how would you do that? Do you think that's realistic if I could do this? And I, I, that's what makes me happy. The reason why I like to do that is because I really struggled when I was in school. I just, I spent um, a lot of time lying around in bed. I was lazy. Um, I had no real drive. I had no ambition. I didn't believe in myself. And actually, that was crazy. That was all in my mind. Just mm -hmm. my, you know, a lot of people suffer with that. And, and actually, one of the things that I want to do by doing these different adventures and things, I do them because I like doing them. Yeah. But I also want to highlight that your brain can be your greatest ally. It doesn't have to be your worst enemy. For a lot of people, it is. But actually, if you just take that, take that first step and do something just just have a go you'll be amazed at how far it will take you yeah. just just by having a go mm -hmm. and saying well, i don't know how far i'm going to get but mm -hmm. i'll have a go you you'll be amazed yeah. so my greatest moments are probably a mix of visiting different schools and different places around the world i love meeting new people and i love traveling very much so mm -hmm. uh, plans for the future jamesy boy right okay tell me so let me let me let me tell you so there's a, just to give you a bit of a co context to, to, to what I'm doing. So I've, I've flown around the world, that's air. I've, I've cycled around the world, that's land. So it would be crazy not to do sea, right? I have to. Swimming? Why would I, I'm not going to swim around the world. But I'm working on a project to sail around the world. And that's not that big a deal. Lots of people have sailed around the world. And I'm not doing it on my own. There's no real value in me just doing something on my own anymore. What I'm actually doing, it's very difficult to take kids away around the world for insurance purposes and stuff. So what I'm actually doing with my next project, I'm taking some ex-offenders away with me. We're not talking of hardened criminals. Yeah, we're if talking, you're looking for them, I can give you a few numbers. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking, yeah, we're talking people that, because you are who you spend your time with. And I believe that you make your own luck, but luck does exist. You mm. don't choose where and who you're born to and the people that you just are naturally around you. And sometimes people uh, make mistakes. They're good people, but you know, they don't really have anyone mentoring them or showing them and guiding the right way to behave and the things to do and not to do. And so I decided that for my next project, uh, I'm going to work on a project to sail around the world. Um, and I'm going to, it's going to be split into about seven or eight legs. And for each leg, I'm going to bring in, uh, they're going to be between the ages of 18 and probably 23, 24, something like that. And the project's really going to be about them and their stories. Um, and I'm going to work with the RYA, the Royal Yachting Association. I'm going to, we're going to teach them how to sail. And I'll, the idea, the vision is that the project gives them something to focus on and ultimately shoots them off in the right trajectory in life as opposed to the wrong way. Um, and I, it's definitely not going to be easy, but I'm quite excited at the prospect of identifying some people that I think will benefit from this opportunity. It, it'll instill some discipline in them, some drive, some, some motivation, that, that feeling of what it's like to wor work towards a worthy goal and achieve it. And, and, and I want to arrange some, some mentorship. Push it through the fear. Absolutely. So these people can be like, wow, mm -hmm. there is something on the other side. There is, 
you, you can get to this great place yeah. of doing things that make you feel fulfilled and happy. And you don't have to be negative. You don't have to, your life doesn't have to be mm -hmm. what someone's told you you're going to be because, you know, everyone has the, the capability to do anything yeah. they want. And so that's really where the project is going and, and focusing on. So yeah, good. yeah that's going to be in 2023. So I'm What's working on that now. What's the ultimate test you think you could do? What's, what would you like to do? A proper test yourself solo? Is there anything in your mind that you would think, right, this is my next adventure? Yeah, I don't, I've kind of, I generally work one thing at a time. Um, I'm not that good at multiple but things. But things you're doing, it needs to be uh, one thing at a time yeah. because it's planned over three months, six it's, it's months. It's planned over sometimes yeah, years. years. Yeah. Um, I would, I would actually quite like um, to go back and row across the Indian Ocean on my own. I think that can be done. Could I do it? In fact, I could do, do, do it. Do you want to do it with me? Uh, yeah, set it or I'll do, do it. Oh, yeah, okay. How long does it take? Well, we're going to need about 60 days. Let's say 60 to 70 days. Uh, in fact, we could probably do it quicker than that. Yeah, it no. all depends. Fuck it, I'll do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm crazy enough to do it <laughs> just to show people this is what I've done. Yeah. But the boat doesn't topple. The, the, the boat, well, it could do. We could we could end up rolling, but you'd be just fine. You'd be all right. It'd be, so you'd be ahead I would of, fucking float anyway. You, it'd be ahead of an adventure. Yeah. You would love it. Yeah. 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 It'd be crazy. But so, yeah, to ask, answer your question in a slightly long winded way, there is kind of something that I would personally like to do. Mm -hmm. um, and that is I've already rode across the Atlantic. I would like to to go back and have another go at the Indian Ocean and I would like to do the Pacific. So I can at least say I've rode the Atlantic, the Indian and the Pacific. So that would be pretty cool. And then uh, I'm. I'll probably start transitioning into other things. Really, I wanna. I I enjoy working with with young people, yeah. and so quite passionate about that. And we'll just see what what kind of happens. Really, yeah. the one thing that I'm afraid of is not fulfilling my potential and not doing enough. And that might sound crazy, but I've realised that actually, there's here's the thing: the more you do, the more you push yourself out there, the more you, th the more you realize you can do, and the more you realize it's out there that you can do and you want to do, and you start pushing more and more and yeah. bigger and bigger. You become greedy. You, yeah, to a degree, it's kind of a bit greedy, but yeah. it's, it's 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 your passion. It's you want to mm -hmm. do more and more and more, and and if I can use these things to try and inspire perhaps people that are in a particular point in their life where they're struggling a little bit for one reason mm -hmm. or another they, they can either join me or, or read about the things yeah. that i've learned because what's your social media james uh, my instagram is at, at ketchel james mm -hmm. and twitter is captain ketch and youtube is just james ketchel for so. anybody that's maybe in this struggle and looking for a wee bit of inspiration what advice would you have for them uh tomorrow is a different day you never know what's around the corner and i'll talk very briefly about this yeah, and this yeah. is something that i learned Take when i was time, mate, no rush. this is what i learned when i was out in the atlantic okay and i call it stay on an even keel what i mean by that is when i was out in the atlantic what determined how i felt and my happiness was my the progress towards my goal so when i had a day where i had a great tailwind and i was flying along it was the best place to be in the world but trust me, as soon as that wind changes direction and you are going backwards, you do not want to be there. And your mental and emotional state would change very, very quickly. And you become down and fed up. You'd start talking yourself out. You'd be looking for ways out of it, thinking, how can I get out of this without losing face, without losing my credibility? Because that's what the brain does. It plays tricks on you. Oh. But I learned something. That it, it never, there was never that long between feeling like that in a real like, oh, I just don't wanna be here anymore. And all of a sudden, like the next day, the wind might change. And all of a sudden you're back on course. And that day that you had the previous day where you felt like shit was just a distant memory and you're feeling great. So I would, I would try to, uh, I would say to anyone who's kind of struggling, things do and things will change and everything is temporary and the, the situation that you're in now will come to an end undoubtedly it will come to an end and actually you'll be amazed at 
what you can do with your mind if you just try to stay positive and you keep active and you kill worst thing you can ever do is stop never ever stop just keep doing something mm -hmm. and work through any kind of difficulties that 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 you're in and it was that concept of just keep going that got me off everest and that mm -hmm. concept of, of keep going that's kind of got me through some of these difficult mm -hmm. situations so my my answer would be just don't stop just don't just keep trying tomorrow is a new day yeah. you never know what the wind will bring mm -hmm. sounds a bit cheesy but it's true it's true what about um, when's your next book out so the next book is out in um december mm -hmm. and uh, yeah so the next book is different to this it's it follows on from this the next book i go into a lot of detail mm -hmm. on all the things that i've been involved with that haven't quite gone to plan yeah but then the finish with the success of flying around the world and, and ultimately what I learned, because I, I want the new book to appeal to people, to anyone that's got a goal, they're working towards something. They don't have to just be a pilot or someone who's into adventure, mm -hmm. because I, I've, I've kind of realized over time, I've been very fortunate to, to, to go and do all these different things, different places, different experiences, some good, some bad, some very dangerous. So I want to try and share the things that I've learned that might be of some value to, to other people. Mm -hmm. Good on you, James. Right. Boy. Yeah. Listen, mate, for your story and for what you're achieving, it's an inspiration Thanks, to man. show Appreciate that it can it. be done. You should be proud, and I look forward to seeing what else you've got in store, man. But like I say, I'm happy to do an adventure for you. No worries. With you, I'm happy Careful to do one. Careful what you wish yeah, for. Yeah, no, listen, James, <laughs> boy, it's an absolute pleasure. God bless you, brother, and thank you stay for safe. having me. Yeah, thank you. No Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.